This is Jocko Podcast number 276 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Archival publications of the Institute of National Remembrance, Poland. Court name, Court of the Pomeranian Military District B. Judge, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Sobiski. Court file number, redacted. Prosecutor's office file number, redacted. Security service file number, redacted. Case examination date, 1981-12-14. Case conclusion date, 1982-12-28. Case description. File in the criminal case against redacted name suspected of printing and distributing leaflets containing false information. That is crime based on Article 48, Section 3 of the Decree of December 12th, 1981 on martial law. Detained temporarily on February 11th, 1982, based on the decision of the Military Prosecutor's Office, February 12th, 1982. The accused, acting together and in consultation with redacted name, produced brochures for distribution which could cause civil disturbances and which contained false information on activity of authorities of the People's Republic of Poland in the period of martial law and calling upon civilians to oppose the authorities and to organize an illegal underground organization that is crime based on Article 48, Section 3 of the Decree of December 12th, 1981 on martial law. Based on the ruling of the court of the Pomeranian Military District, redacted name is sentenced to three years of imprisonment and three years of loss of civil rights, a charge to be paid on behalf of the state treasury in the amount of 4,200 PLN, reimbursement of one third of the costs of court proceedings. So that is a document from a book. The book is called Camp Posey, and it's written by an individual called Naval, who is a member of the Polish Grom Special Forces. And the document is from the case against a man whose name is redacted in the document. His name is Thomas Zoran. Thomas was born and raised in communist Poland. And he made a stand against the authoritarian communist regime and was sent to prison for his actions. Sent to prison for speaking out against the evils of communism and he ended up in prison communist prison and I I guess I need not talk about the condition of communist prisons because we've discussed them on this podcast before but it goes saying goes without saying that those prisons are not for the faint of heart but luckily Thomas Zoran possessed an incredibly strong will and he survived prison and he made it out of prison and eventually he made it out of Poland. And eventually he made it to the United States where he eventually joined the Navy and became a SEAL. And this is also where Thomas Zoran took on a new name, a nickname, Drago. And this is where I was lucky enough to serve alongside him on and off the battlefield. And this is where we became brothers. And it is an honor to have him here tonight to share his story with us. Drago, welcome. Thank you. It's awesome to be here on your podcast. Uh, I follow it for a long time and (laughs) eventually I... 
Thank you for inviting me, and um, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, somebody on some something reached out and said, well, why don't you have Drago on? And I was like, anytime, Drago wants to come on. <laughs> no, no factor, <laughs> of course. <laughs> So this is like one of the craziest stories as far as backstories go, not just for joining the SEAL teams, but joining the military in general. I mean, it's pretty straightforward what happens to most American kids, right? Oh, I want to be a soldier. They join the Army, the Navy, the, the Air Force, the Marine Corps. That's what they do. Man, your story is about as crazy as it gets for backstories. <laughs> I guess it is. But for my, maybe not crazy, but it's different. And uh, just even from, uh, well, uh, let me just back out a little bit. Uh, when I came to America, I came with a bag of clothes and 10 Phoenix, the German, was like less than 10 cents in my pocket. So everything I have, everything I own, I owe it to America, to you, to American people. So I promised myself that uh, I will be the best citizen uh, that America can have. I'll do everything to be the as good citizen as I can be. So, uh, yeah, the beginnings were very hard, but, but like, no, there's not, nothing unusual. You can don't speak English. You, you, I didn't come here with expectations like, hey, give me a job and make, make tons of money. And I, I just wanted to work. I just wanted to leave free man. And that was given to me. So that promise, I, I, I try to, I, I still keep it deep in my heart that, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm successful, I've succeeded, but there is so much more to do for America, for our country. And uh, that's what I, that was my goal, be the best American citizen America can have. So let, let's, let's take it back a little bit before you get over here with less than 10 cents in your pocket. So you're born in Poland, is that right? You're yes. born in Poland? Yes, I was born in you're Poland. You're born in Poland. W what did your parents do? My father was communist. He was, uh, he was a professor, he was a teacher, then became, uh, became a party member, they joined the Polish, that's really not communism, more socialism. Uh, they're very the same, we can talk about the differences later, but so my father was a, a party member. My mother was, uh, was a, teacher. She was an elementary school teacher. So when I was born, my father was already starting his career with political communist, Polish Communist Party. Now, is that is that something that, you, you know, if you're if you're living in Poland, and you see the Communist Party on the rise, your dad looks around and says, Hey, you know what, I kind of gotta, I kind of gotta go with the flow and get with this party if I'm going to advance my career in life. I think that's what it was. Uh, but you know, he came from a very poor family too. So the opportunity they gave it to him, say, look, if you just close your eyes on some moral aspect of socialism and uh, just follow that our doctrine and uh, you're gonna be successful. And he fell for it. He went, he became very successful. Eventually he ended up in Warsaw in the, pretty much in the top uh, communist government as a, one of the directors of uh, ministry of art and culture. So uh, he was successful, yeah. But it sounds like your mom wasn't quite as on board with looking away from some of those immoral aspects of communism. Uh, neither my mom, neither my father's mom. I remember uh, that that was big rift in our, in our entire family. I remember as a little kid, maybe six, seven years old, visiting my grandmother, and I mean, my father's mother, my grandmother, yeah. And she always was telling me, communists are evil, they are devils, Socialists is evil. socialism is evil system. And I always had the image of socialist or communist as a guy with the big tail, with the big horns breathing fire. I remember I even asked my grand grandmother, they breathe fire? And uh, my grandma, yeah, they are worse than they, they murder people quietly on, this, on, on the sides. And, uh, uh, they, they are just really bad as evil. Uh, so that in my mind was always communism, socialism, that's pretty evil system, it is. Um, and uh, I remember my father tried to protest, mom, look, I'm not evil, I'm not really, uh, I'm, I'm your son. She looked at him, you are, if you sold your soul to socialism and communism, 
if you that, that you're part of these murders that are quietly happening in Poland, so you are evil, and I don't even want to consider you to be my son. That she was very adamant about it. So for me, it was like always I remember before going to bed. We were my my grandmother teach me how to pray. So I was praying. And I remember we always close the prayer. God, please help us take all the communism, communists and socialists out of Poland. So I just <laughs> just kind of grew up with it, and uh, it was never different. And uh, uh, the the rift between my mom and and my father, I still remember. There was I think it was I don't remember what age it was, but we wanted to go to church. My mother wanted to go to church uh, on Sunday, and I still remember my father standing in front of the door, say. We cannot go because I'm going to lose my job. We cannot go. I'm going to lose my job. We are not going to church. The church, the, the communism and church and socialism and church are not compatible. And uh, we're just not going there. So my grandmother was visiting at the same time. So my mother left. They couldn't, he couldn't stop her. My grandmother passed me through the window to my mom. Down, uh, uh, it was on the first floor. And we still went to the church. But uh, that was pretty much constant. Right? Eventually, that, that marriage fell apart. My father went with the communists and socialists. Uh, I, I stayed with mom. Uh, well, my, my brother, my younger sister, stayed with mom. So that was, uh, it was very difficult, too, for us. Because at that time in Poland, it's, it changed now. But at that time in Poland, if your parents divorced, you as a child were stigmatized. Mm-hmm. So you were a divorcee, you know, there's like the parents will say, hey, you don't go play with this guy because his parents just got divorced. He's just divorcee. There was a kind of derogatory name in Polish that we were called. So they actually kind of toughened me out because I ended up actually beating up some of these guys and they, they left me alone. They were not my friends, but they, they never bothered me again. So that, that worked. <laughs> So what, what, uh, you're going to school every day? Is this like normal? Is that what's happening in Poland in the, in the, this is in the late seventies, huh? Or the seventies? That was uh, 1968. Remember, I, I'm 60 years old. So I was born 15 years after second world war. So this is, I was born with a less, this time distance that we have between we, our beginning between September 11 and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and today, and this is still so fresh in our minds, right? September 11, this like happened yesterday. So I was born just 15 years after the uh, Second World War. So I was still playing the ruins and the broken houses. There were some people were still finding bombs, unexploded bombs and explosives. Uh, kind of in- interesting. <laughs> so, so are you going to school? Is that is yes. that normal? Are they state-run schools? Is there communism? Are you being taught communism in the schools? Oh yes, absolutely. I have actually a couple notes I found from my uh, from my notebook from school. Those elementary school, like later classes, like seventh grade, about communism and socialism. Yes, you were indoctrinated uh, from the very beginning in socialism and communism, and the the things are very uh, funny there because. The government, the socialist government, they feel like they need to have a total control, and they, rush, they, they have to, but otherwise people will just, people don't subscribe to slavery. So, so socialism is not really that good system. They don't want it. So they, they, uh, I remember they forced us in fifth grade, I was in fifth grade elementary school, and we had to learn Russian. I was not really, I was never the best student, and then they threw the Russian on me as like, for that we had to learn the shit. I don't want to learn it. And I'll kind of open up in my in the class. I say, look, I'm Polish. I don't want to go and uh, learn Russian language. I, I don't want to learn it. I don't feel like I'd rather learn English or rather learn German. Oh my God, I, I had no idea what was going to happen. But next thing I was pulled out to the principal's office. Uh, my mother, she was a teacher in different schools, so they, 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 they called the police, the secret police came in, they picked my mom, they drove her to uh, to principal where I was already waiting there, scared shitless, and uh, they uh, they say, so what happened? So the teacher explained that I am anti-socialist, apparently I don't like socialism, and I am uh, also objecting to Russian language, indoctrina- the Russian indoctrination. So my mom is all in tears. She's scared, all shaking. Then they drag my brother into it, drag my sister. They had no idea what's going on. So we sit up there or there. And, and they were very clear. I still remember that if it happens again, these kids will go to orphanage. That government will make them good citizens if you cannot do that. So this is, this is your last warning. And uh, so I had to wise up a little bit. I never changed my attitude. I was always outspoken. 
But uh, I remember that fear that my mom lived for that in the rest of our lives until uh, and the rest of the, the time when we were still growing up and the state could take uh, the kids away from her. So that uh, that's uh, the, the other interesting part of it is that like uh, today I have a 11 years old, 12 years old daughter, 11 years old son. I'm looking over them like hawk. I don't let them go anywhere where I can see them. I, I they can play, but I have to be always able to go and assist if something happens. What didn't happen in Poland? In Poland, I remember I was seven, eight years. I was eight years old. I was driving across the town, taking bus, crossing the streets, going to somewhere else, and uh, it was like there's no big deal. All the kids they were just ten miles away from school, where we have to commute and. We just commuted. It was like no big deal. My mom just bought me a ticket. So every time I got into the bus, if I could, because they were so crowded, you just have to pull yourself in. And sometimes the door don't close, so you're just holding yourself in it. Your legs are sticking out, but you're just going to school. Um, so that was kind of, um, yeah, there was uh, like, we, I don't know, it is because we felt, we did feel safe. My mom apparently feels safe about it. And maybe this is because there was no internet at the time. So some of the crime that happened was not very transparent. It was not very uh, readily, the information about it was not readily available. So people didn't know if something bad happened. So I remember going to kindergarten. So I was, uh, that was, I think I was five and a half years old. So we had to go from, uh, from our home. I took my younger brother. So he was maybe three and a half. And by hand, we are carrying the house shoes in another hand. We had like the house shoes. What's, what's house shoes? It's like a, uh, uh, slippers. Because in kindergarten, you cannot wear those shoes that you wear outside. You have to have a slippers. So okay. It has to be clean, everything. So we had the slippers in our hands. We're going to around the school, around the street, across the street. Actually, a, m- a friend of mine got killed on that street by the motorcycle. So, but it was like no, not a really big deal. So, you, when you go across the street, you look left, you look right, and uh, make sure nothing is there, and you just walk across the street. So, we just walk to the kindergarten by ourselves, being six and a half, six, five years old. So <laughs> today, I think I, I would go into jail for letting things like that happen to my kids. But at the time, it was just that was very common in Poland. That's nothing I think wrong. So you're, you're, you get this experience in fifth grade where you basically say you're, you don't want to learn Russian. They, they crack down on your mom, your brother, your sister. Yes. Did you at any point were you so, were you so, you, you saw what happened between your mom and your dad. You'd been told your whole life that communism was evil. Did, so did you just kind of suppress that a little bit to, to keep from getting taken away from your mom? Um, I did, but maybe not intentionally. Really, at that time, I was not political. I was just like, I was just annoyed that I have to have the language that my grandmother tells me those people are not really good in, they don't do good things in Poland. They, uh, they oppress Poland, so why do I have to learn that language? So there was nearly not so much political, but the state was very political. The state was very, uh, they were very cautious with citizens. They wanted to control, and they did control almost every aspect of social life. That's what socialism is. And uh, so that didn't really, the, 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 the political part, came later when I started learning about the murders, the political murders, the oppression of socialism. Uh, uh, and uh, then what has became a little bit more aware of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Then reading about the uh, people disappearing from the street and like never heard from them again. Uh, that became a little bit, more, then I became a little more aware. And uh, so then in uh, late 70s, in Poland, had so much, so enough of these lies. Because, because what happened is we had the empty shelves. There was nothing to eat. Uh, uh, and you can't buy food. You can't buy clothes. You cannot buy furniture. But all you hear how great is in Poland in socialist system. If you look at America, people are sleeping on the street. And they, you know, we had no access to any information. They show those tents or they show those shacks where poor people sometimes or, 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 or stay. Or they show the worst thing about America so that that was just uh, people knew that this lie Mm -hmm. so they got so fed up that eventually no matter what that socialist press said people didn't believe it they say that this is this is brown 
people think they know that they're lying, even if it was brown. <laughs> this is how they had enough. It had to explode, and that uh, that thing was accumulating. First, the people lost the faith in in the government. They lost the faith in the the, the truth that written, the truth, the, the, the lies that are being told. They they stopped paying attention to it. So at the end, no matter what they said, people didn't believe. Mm-hmm. They had enough of it, and it exploded in the solidarity trade right. union movement, where that people just raised up and say, "Enough is enough. We had enough of socialism and communism." When you're when you're um, growing up, you talked about fifth grade. You're in eighth grade. You're in ninth grade. You're in tenth grade, and I know we're going to end up talking about this. At some point, you learned how to fight. Like, not just what you, you learned how to street fight and you learned how to fight on some level. Did you, what did you train? Did you train Taekwondo? Did you train boxing? What did you train? I started with boxing, just regular boxing. And I remember, you know, being just my mom growing us up uh, and my younger brother and sister. So sometimes I had to fight for my brother too, <laughs> quite often. Um, and so the box boxing, was an opportunity for me to kind of like uh, codify what I already knew to just learn maybe this technical skills now. And it worked great. I mean, I really liked it. But then, uh, the, the, again, so my brother got beat up at school, I think because we were divorcees. So there, there's people just. So I always remember I was sick and uh, I said, well, I, I need to go to school. Then I just packed my stuff. I went to school. I found the big guy. That guy was like huge. So I just knocked him out. And, 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 and knock him out so bad that this, this guy show up with his mom later in the evening in my apartment. And it's like, his mother like, see this? Your son did that to my son. He can lose his eye. I mean, I, I look at the guy from like behind the corner and I was like, holy shit, the guy has no eye. <laughs> He's like big swollen head. Um, and so my mom just kind of come on in. And she's like, look at me, I'm like half of his size. And this guy is huge and he's crying. So uh, it's like, so that guy beat your son? I was like, yeah, yeah, you see what he did to, to him? So if your son that big let him happen to that, I think he deserves it. Why don't you just guys leave? <laughs> so um, yeah, they left. Did, uh, was there a boxing gym? Was there a boxing yeah, coach? Yeah, there was, was there like a actually, there official was a, program or something? There was an official program, yes. There, actually, there was the police club. I didn't know about that time, but the clubs like this were on, on usually by the police. So so yeah, I belong to, they call it Guardia. So, uh, so yeah, I belong to this club, but w- when I nailed this guy, I broke my hand. Mm. I didn't know it. So that put me on uh, So some of my friends went on their first boxing matches and stuff. I just stay, had to stay home and kind of, then we just moved to different towns. So, but it was my, my start was with the boxing and I liked it. I got involved in the eventually with Taekwondo. And <laughs> that's kind of a funny story too, because my attitude was a bit different. And the Taekwondo they practiced in Poland at that time, there was there's two different types of Taekwondo, ITF, WTF. I, uh, so we did the ITF, there's like no covering or anything, you just go and duck it out. Uh, so we went to the first Polish championship and I didn't know any better. They put this thing on me. I was like, how do I fight with that? But okay. So I just keep knocking these guys out and just keep progressing. <laughs> so I got every time I, I finish my fight, I say, yes, you, you have minus points for the being brutal. The your fight is brutal. You can do that. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, it was like, it was funny. And the final fight, uh, final fight for the first place, I knocked the guy out. And there's, so the guy is laying there. The, the guy, the, the judge come, comes to me and say, like, you, you being disqualified from the program. You, I mean, not quite disqualified, but he's the winner. So then, you know, they announce, okay, this is a uh, winner is saying, so right here, the guy's just laying there, <laughs> passed out. So I was like, okay, well, but anyway, I guess it was, I was not very, uh, my fight was not very sports-like because I got a lot of whistles and booing after <laughs> I, I went as a second, to take my second place medal. <laughs> and that kind of ended up. And then, you know, the, the prison came in and uh, actually they helped me a lot in prison. I, I'm glad that uh, I was able to help other political prisoners. There's a friend of mine who actually I've met again when I visited Poland recently. So um, since I didn't have anything to do up there, just sit and <clears throat> we just... Just being, hey, you are solidarity, I'm solidarity, let's go train. So we're training, and he said, look, what you did 
to me, helped me later survive the beatings that I got from the guards and the, the, and, and all that stuff. So, so, so you were going. Let, before we get to being in prison, so now it's the late seventies. Now, at some point, you must you made a decision that you're not you're not going to comply with communism. You're gonna you're gonna fight against it. Yes. Uh, the, the, the initial, I didn't even know how to, but the 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 the, the first thing actually when I when it's my, when it start changing my when when it start making me aware of what's really going on in Poland was uh, I started listening to Radio Free Europe and the Voice of America and BBC. This station, you could go to prison for listening to it. So I remember my mom was like in panic. Oh my God, I can hear you. Get more pillows on your uh, over your head. Get more of those big uh, 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 blankets so w- the neighbors don't hear. That she was in fear. She, she could she could go to prison for that. So uh, so I was listening to BBC. So you how know? old how old are you? At that time, I think I was 12, 13, 14. So, uh, so I was getting older and I was getting more interested in what's going on. This is when I learned that, you know, that the, the, the socialists are actually quietly killing people who are inconvenient to them or those people disappear. Like, we don't know where this guy is. The, the, he was very outspoken about socialism and he just disappeared. So, uh, so I was learning about it. I was learning also about the, the murders, the extrajudicial uh, uh, murders, uh, committed by judges in Poland who subscribe to socialist ideology. Um, so that's where it started changing uh, in me. They say, this is not wrong, this is wrong what's, what's going on in Poland. How did those murders take place? Usually you just, uh, I, I tell you what, how it could happen because uh, nobody knows, but uh, I tell you what happened to me eventually. So I was working from the gym, we we're working out, just f- do some fights and, uh, can you get the police pulls in, say, hey, just grab you by the hands, pull in the car, and just go. That's it. And that's it. And then just they drive me, I say, like, I say, like where are we going? I say, well, where are we go? Once we made that, it won't let any more matter to you anything. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, fuck. So I'm already thinking, like, hey, uh, so if we get out of this car, I'm going to kick this guy out. I'm going to do this. I'm, they're going to shoot me. They're going to kill me, most likely, but at least I'm not going to go down quietly. And um, But they just drove around the town, just dropped me off in the other part of the town, I had to walk back home for a few miles. <laughs> so, so that's just like intimidation, and, uh, letting intim- you know yes. what they can do yes. if they want to. Yes, yes. How old are you when that kind of thing starts happening? Uh, that started happening when, uh, uh, that happened after I was released from prison. That, okay. But before that, this is, I assume, this is how these people disappear. They don't like you, you are sp- outspoken. You cannot, we either comply or we just destroy you or your family. That's, that's how socialism works. And um, so I experienced that, how they disappear people after I got out of prison. But before that, I was not aware. I just knew that people were just there and that they were not there any longer. Or they committed suicide or they fall off the stairs. So that's some, uh, it was just something that was waking up in me. Mm-hmm. That this socialist system is very oppressive, and you can't live as a free man when uh, in op- oppression like this. I remember actually wo- at that time it was also downing on me that there's different countries they have different systems that are free. I learned about America. I remember in Warsaw. First, every time I was in Warsaw, I always like to go to U.S. embassy because they have those. Beautiful cars, those big cities, that's, that's, those are their images, you know, it's like, I can pick through the fence, I can see like, whoa, look at this car. You know, and then I was like, uh, the, the images, they have all those, uh, like uh, glass things on the fence where you can read about America. I was like, oh, why, why Poland cannot be like that? You know, why, this is so awesome. I, I remember every chance I had. So this is like, when, when I look at American flags, something like taking my heart, it's like, this is so free. This is this is the this is the freedom, and I always from then on I always carry. So whenever something happened in Poland, I was like, we need to change. We need to be like America. So that's where the start. So my my views start maturing. And uh, so, how, how old were you when you started to actually 
do something about it that you you know what you eventually get arrested for at what point and was it was it other kids was there some kind of leadership network of people that were leading solidarity do you join the solidarity movement how did what did that look like it when it crystallized i remember uh, the first strikes happen uh, people were hungry i said i want to we want food and freedom so they um, they organized strikes this is where like walesa came in the picture mm-hmm. He was the, the, the prominent, eventually became the leader of Solidarity, the trade union movement in Poland. So my mom got involved and I got involved. On, and I got involved with my friends up there on the different level. My mom was involved in school and uh, this is how it went. And so then we start, uh, there was really not much to do at the time because the Solidarity was doing everything. They were, there was the first trade union, the one for trade union. There was the first movement in Eastern Bloc country that was independent from socialist regime, from socialist communist party. So that was, uh, I was just like, uh, I couldn't read enough what that was being published, what really happened in 19, when the, when the communism and socialism came to Poland after the second world war on the Stalin's bayonets, uh, that's we started learning, you know, about the atrocities, about the murders. Uh, about the the, the 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 freedom that we didn't know that we are not free sometimes that but w- when we learn about how other countries how is it, it is being done in america so that's when i start actually maturing it started growing and 19 uh, so that was right before the it was before the martial law it was late 1970s when especially with the john uh, uh, pope came to poland and he like rise people up. He said, "Look, you can live on your knees. You need to rise up." You know, basically his message. He didn't say it directly, but his message was like this, or was taken this way, and people raised up and kicked the socialist ass out. So, so the the they had seen. I mean, the communists had seen this kind of thing happen in other Eastern Bloc country countries. I mean, Hungary had happened, so they kind of they followed that. So so they they were nervous about that so they end up declaring martial law they they do martial law to try and yes they try lost and suppress the, the the solidarity movement yes they lost control they knew it and there is no way to putting this genie back i think something <laughs> happened with trump here <laughs> so you can you can't put it back but unless, uh, unless uh, you unleash violence so they realize that they cannot go back to what it used to be people won't trust them people don't trust them they know they are liars they know that they were they, everybody knew they were liars and thieves too. So um, they uh, decide eventually, say like we had enough, we are losing control, and if it continues, they will hang us. They, they will, they, these people hate us really for what we have, what the socialism done to these people. They will, hang, they will prosecute us. So they impose martial law. And I remember I was on the phone with a friend of mine, he was in Austria, and midnight click, as we're talking, quiet. I say, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> that, no, uh, no connection. So then people are start coming. Hey, they just shut down all the TVs, all the radios. There's no communication. The telephone lines didn't work. They shut down entire, uh, the communication in entire Poland. And I think 15 after midnight, they start rolling in. So I was at the Solidarity headquarters at the time at midnight. When they came in, so they they just broke the door. They round up everybody who was there. They haul us on the um, uh, on the police station, and then they they, they only hold those people who who hold prominent leadership positions. So that night they arrested. I have different estimates there, from twenty five thousand people on the low side to sixty five thousand people arrested th- that night. They were not criminal arrests. They were the, the basically. The way they explain to us that those people are not arrested, in, they're sitting in jail, but they are interned. We intern them for their safety because we want them to be safe and also they were potentially dangerous to the state. So they were not really dangerous. They were, they, 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 it's not like they did something. Mm-hmm. They were potentially dangerous to the state, so we didn't jail them. We just interned them. They have a good living conditions. We provide them food. <laughs> it's just, it is so ridiculous now when I'm listening to, to what I say, and it is so sounds so weird. But that was the fact then. That was the the, the way 
we perceive that reality that was quite normal. Oh, well, you know, martial law, they jail 60,000 people one night. We need to do something. This is why I get eventually get we and a couple of my friends start building them, say we cannot just sit and idly and watch it. We What we're going to do is send the shutdown of the communications. We're going to create our own. So we're going to create our own network. And we start printing and then just work, working. It was pretty naive the way we did that. But you know, we didn't know that that many better. So we just print what happened. We print the names of the uh, uh of people arrested, so the families know that these people just didn't disappear, yet they're just <laughs> sitting in prison now. Eventually, so we stopped the, distributing that in uh, in my city where I was at the time growing up, and that's how it started. So we functioned for a while until we got caught, <laughs> and then of course it was not very difficult for them because they were prepared for that, and um, and that's how I ended up in uh, in prison. Eventually, they start publishing lists of some of the some of the people they they in turn basically put them in prisons. So, so you get you get arrested. They come to your house. Do they find you at school? Do they find? Did no, they grab actually, you on the street? What they do? Actually, they got me pretty much off the street. I was working at the point where we were printing it to pick up more of the uh, our newspapers that we printed out. And as soon as I walked in, I knock on the door. Uh, the code we had <laughs> so naive and the doors open it's like three guys run up from the upstairs uh, f- f- it, was, it was on the like a stairway uh the, the, like five guys jump out of the room and just put the i had like 10 guns in my head it was like a police stand of almost the gun from every side pointing <laughs> <laughs> and uh so i like, got handcuffed and uh haul away and uh get in prison so in in jail and here goes another story they, th- this is something I had no idea. I didn't know that I can have a lawyer. Y- you could, but they, they, they just ignore that. So it really matter. It was b- besides, it was martial law, so it was a little bit different. So I got to jail. They said, okay, so did you do it? I said, no. Did you do it? No. You did it? No. So, you know, got a little bit beat up, and, uh, but I, I, I stuck by my thing. And uh, No, I didn't. I don't know. So what about these papers? What did you find in your house? Because they went to my house later. This, they searched my house. My mom later told me that she, they, they just de- demolished my house, uh, my apartment, my home. I mean, I live with my mom there, so they demolished her apartment. I, said, I, was, just, I was a still kid. And uh, so I said, well, I just found them on the street. Like, oh, you found them on the street. It didn't really matter because I got a three years prison sentence <laughs> right off the bat. So um, I remember the funny thing is like, they, uh, they got me from, uh, we're going to the, uh, from the prison to, to the court. So they took my boots away. So you take their boots. I said, well, why do you take my boots? So uh, this guy, other cop comes out. So yeah, this guy kicks. So he cannot run away. He cannot kick with the bare feet. I say, well, I do kick with the bare feet. <laughs> so they beat me up for that. So, and I went to the court. I said, look, I was beat up. I said, like, we don't care. <laughs> I basically, I was there with the judge, but I say, like, we, we don't care. It didn't happen. So you, what's the what's the prison conditions? Uh, prison conditions that for me at the time I didn't know any better. I, I said like, prison I thought always has to be bad, but again you're always hungry, right? You have no rights. You can't see. Oh, there's another funny thing because when I went up there, they say you can't, you cannot lay down. You cannot. You have to just sit on those stools all day long, and just at the table, uh, like close rough table and from meal to meal just wait there when that cow comes in you go to uh you'll go to uh you go to lay down in the bed so i'm just trying to be you know like i'm still scared i'm new to this environment i'm sitting but it's like fuck i ain't going to sit here all the goddamn day long <laughs> but i'm going to lay down see what will happen so i just lay down just came in just kick the shit out of me on outside so I'm coming back to the cell. I say, well, well now I'm beat up. I can hardly see in my eyes. So I say, fuck it. I don't think they're going to beat me up again. Now they know I have a legitimate reason to lay down. I can't see it. So I now they came did it again. <laughs> so I like, repeat three times. Finally, like to say, I guess they say, like, fuck it. They ain't going to see it. They ain't going to be laid down. So just left me there. So, so I had no problems. But then there's one of those criminal guys, because we keep common criminals. He say, fuck, he ain't that tough. I'm tougher than him. So... I think I, I can earn my way to fucking too. I don't want to sit all day at the table, just on the stool, no baggers or anything. So he lay down in bed, and he's bed up there across. 
And uh, it was my friend. It was not my bed because it was, uh, there was like four beds, but it was like 15 of us there. So we slept on the floor. But I said, like, fuck it. Try to kick me out of there. <laughs> so, uh, so he lay down on the bed. And the same story, just you can hear the screaming, the beating out. Blah, 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 blah. He comes back all black and blue. And he doesn't go to bed. He goes to the table and he sings. <laughs> he, 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 that was it. He was like, okay, well, I'm, I had enough. <laughs> I, I, I will sit. <laughs> so it turns out he wasn't quite as tough as you. Uh, well, I don't know if there's a uh, about toughness. I just, he, you know, he, he was not prepared for the beating. So, <laughs> so he was like, well, I don't really need that. I'd rather put that with sitting on the, on, on the stool in, in front of, at the table than, than uh, deal with these guys. So eventually they, uh, <laughs> and actually I was so naive. I had no idea. So they told me, hey, those, those, those old prisoners, like, you know, if we can make the hole in this wall to this other cell, we can have a sugar and some other food, because these guys have a lot of stuff. So I said, yeah, fuck it, I do it, you know, just, just climb under the bed and start burning this thing. <laughs> so I yeah, made a hole maybe like this big, but didn't go far, because of course, you know, it's like there's no, no tools or nothing. Wait, what were you, try what were you trying to do? I'm trying to, to be, mm, break the hole in the wall to using the- Using what, using? Uh, using the, like a, the, 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 the uh, from the, Stool that you see. Okay. The leg, you take them apart. You take so the you leg took the, and then you took the stool apart and, and you had the leg and you tried yeah. to get through a concrete yeah, wall. Like a, well, okay, yeah, like, it was not. It was not really that hard, actually. It was not maybe that concrete in the beginning, but eventually I got to the concrete. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, so it went, no, it went nowhere. So I got pulled out. Somebody pulling me by the legs and you know get the good kicks and <laughs> stuff and put out the cell. So um, so here it is. Then I'm back in this. And there's not the principal with the ward, warden. So you have a lot of problems with you, you know, you're gonna go, you do it again, we're gonna go and put you in isolation. And we, they call it like a tiger cage. So it was a cell, and within the cell was a cage, just like a, in the zoo, and just put you there. So uh, I say, okay, well, whatever, I'm, I'm not going to be punching the walls in the, uh, uh, holes in the wall, okay? Because like, it was so stupid, but uh, I didn't know any better. So then I'm, every, every day for like 15 minutes, we're allowed to go outside and walk. There was like a room, maybe half size of this, with the high walls with the guards walking on the top of, uh, above you. And um, the funny thing is that it was made of these concrete posts with the slit inside. We've, we've seen them in Iraq and this uh, 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 reinforced concrete slab was slide in between the posts, mm -hmm. one on the top of another. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I was thinking, take one. I remember I was just for demonstration, I was breaking those in half. So I thought that I heard the voice of the guy who was in the case with me. So I said, I need to communicate with him. Let me take a look. I didn't mean to break that shit. I would just go, just like, get a quick walk, jump, and just kick that shit. So I thought, just make you move this, some of this mud from in between those cracks, between these mm -hmm. slabs. That fucking thing fell off. So <laughs> <laughs> and just this whole two slabs above just fall down on it. It's like you can see that the alarms going on everywhere. I was like, what the fuck? I don't know. So, so I end up in the ti tiger cage. Uh, <laughs> the time just sitting there. And now there was no, there was not the one time. There was the final time. But the, the second, the, the other time, they put me in the prison with uh, with the broken windows. It was winter time, and they gave me no blanket. So I was just laying on those woods for uh, I think it was a week. So it was, not, it was you know. It was was okay. I was freezing, but there was nothing that would kill me. And um, you, you know, like I'm looking, watching some of the TVs here about the prison in the United States. I was like, "Fuck!" You know, if at that time I wouldn't trade, I would trade my life in Poland for prison here because <laughs> I would be fed. I have medical attention. I had a TV. I would have a gym, maybe possible even. And uh, and uh, how can you live better? I mean, what else can you? do you want from life just you have you have everything provided to you you know you don't have to fight for anything so that's that's how, <laughs> that's how so how long we how long did you end up staying in prison for? uh there was three years prison sentence and they released us i think close to a year and a half or after a year and a half when john paul ii was coming to poland again so they tried to make a gesture so okay we start releasing political prisoners for on amnesty and uh, you know, they start, I noticed they start releasing us, and uh, some uh, the prisons start shrinking because you know after the case was done, my case I was sentenced to uh, got my sentence. They ship us to Russian border. We were in prison called Khrubyshev. 
um, basically you can through the window you can see the the river and can see the Russian territory next uh, next to it. So it's kind of like unnerving because at that time there was a reality of uh, invasion. I mean we were afraid that the Russians will come in to take to, to put some uh, uh, order there because they, they think it was the communism and socialism was falling apart. So they. Um, we knew that if the Russians come in, we're gonna get killed. Mm-hmm. So we were thinking, like, well, we're gonna get killed anyway. If, if they come in, this is what we need to do. We had like a plans, actually, you know, how to bridge the uh, bridge, not the bridge like we know as a seals now, <laughs> but how to get through the wall, how to get this. We're just making the, the getting the equipment done. So, so they maybe kill some, but maybe they not don't want to kill everybody. But we cannot just sit here in prison and just wait for to be slaughtered. So there, there was that 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 thinking uh, at the time in present. So we, uh, so yeah, so we were in this, uh, that's actually a couple other things came to my mind too, I didn't even think about it. So they beat us up, I remember I had some issues with, uh, oh okay, we, so we went on the hunger strike. So okay, we are we're on hunger strike. We, we want status of political prisoner. They were some head of, in socialism, I don't know if you guys knew, but in socialism, there are no political prisoners. The, the, there are, but they are sitting for something else. They are sitting like stealing the milk from the from in, from in front of the, somebody's old door, or just insulting the neighbor, or um, just being mean to somebody. So they put you for something else. So they always claim political prisoners, not in socialism. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't have that. Everybody, until the martial law, who was locked up, for political activities was like that pretty much for something else, for, for some criminal offenses, they, 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 they could generate it. So yeah, that was um, something that, uh, uh, when they, so they, they sent us to Hrubyshov, they, they, they kind of isolate the, the political prisoners there from the, the general criminal population. So just like, like pretty much good luck. And uh, they, um, so we decided to go on the, on the hunger strike. And, the way they broke our strike was uh, in Poland. They said there is a law that after two weeks, if you don't eat, we will forcefully feed you. So what they did was like a like a vacuum pipe almost. <laughs> so I said, "God damn, I ain't gonna come into my stomach." And <clears throat> so they put this thing in your throat, and they just put it the uh, whatever the mixture they they, they gave you there. And I remember, I didn't know it was that bad, but so I said, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll fight these guys. So I find, so they finally they overpowered me, they hang up me to the chair, but when they tried to put this pipe again, I just broke the fucking chair. So they were fighting, they, they broke the different chair, this time I couldn't break out of it, and they actually forced it. Later I learned how to you know deal with it, so uh, yeah, I, I, I was like, no big deal, just go ahead, stick it, put it my, my food in it, but what the way they broke it is a typical socialist way, very sneaky. So they got to, especially the older guys, say, look, you see this big pipe, and I, mean, I had to shove it back down your throat, in your stomach again, and and put it in. Why don't you just take it yourself? Just drink that shit and go to your cell. So they're like, hmm, that, that's pretty painful. So I just like, okay. As soon as you just take it one sip, it's like, wham. Oh, hey, you just broke your hunger strike. You just ate on your own. So now we're gonna transport you to another prison. The guy never had a chance, most likely, to go to his prison cell. He was just handcuffed, put in the transport, and drove drove away somewhere. So the, eventually, there was only a few of us left, and the, the call came from the church that this is pointless. The the socialists socialists will never admit they hold political prisoners, and uh, you just waste your health in to stop it. So we did, so eventually we stopped that. And uh, I totally forgot about it until I went to Poland and met this guy. He said, hey, do you remember the hunger strike here? I have the calendar here, this, this, this. You need to, the, I was like, shit, yeah, I remember now, <laughs> I don't remember that. So How uh, long were you on the hunger, hunger strike for? I think it was three weeks we did it before the cow came in to stop it because we were going nowhere. Um, uh, yeah, I need, to look, I need to look, he gave me that calendar, I don't have it here, but, uh, and to look into it. This is interesting, actually, because uh, the, yeah, the, the, there was things, too, that uh, we did in prison. I can't sing word of shit. I'm, I'm not a singing person and, at all. <laughs> but I was singing like a motherfucker in prison. That's the, those political songs that from po- Polish, 
past, from Polish history. Uh, they were very patriotic songs, which socialists really hated. So uh, we in prison, it was at eight o'clock in the uh, in the evening. I believe it was eight o'clock in the evening. We just opened the windows on the whole side, and the entire prison population from the even the criminals still join in. But they get beat up and shut down very quick, and there was there like, was they squashed them, but not with us. So uh, we kept singing, and that was so loud that that nearby town they could hear and actually that priest was coming and praying in front of the prison mm -hmm. so uh yeah that the guards hated it because you know they, they were they ran up to one cell they beat up people up they throw them and close the windows up as soon as they leave the windows got open again and people are singing on the cell so that's only so much they could do um that, that yeah that was uh that was funny actually the the, the I, I need to send it i send it to you because i have a they were so bad i guess for them they I didn't have any family at the time, just my mom. So they sent a letter to my mom complaining, say, hey, come here and do something, your son is not listening. <laughs> and and, and I, actually I was showing to my wife, Rachel, say, look, this, this, look at this here, because I knew that I had that, I just couldn't, but then I just by accident I found it. So I have this document saying, they're saying to le letter from prison, so just come out and help, because they, they, I, I'm not listening to socialist guards. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any guards or any government officials that were like sympathetic at all? Or did they just they just the, had to toe the party line? Uh, they had to toe the party line, but there were uh, some of the guards that they were not so vicious. So uh, they were they they just not uh, they listened. Sometimes like uh, there was even we uh, were able to smuggle the camera into the prison. I'm sure that some of the guards knew about it and. Uh, there, there are some pictures floating. I think I, I've seen some of the pictures from the prison at the time. And uh, some of them, like, you know, on the, during Christmas time, so uh, we had this nurse say, like, well, can you send us some alcohol? No, we cannot have alcohol, but we have this alcohol to clean the skin. So I said, well, no, let's, uh, you know, why don't we just, yeah. So we just... Uh, uh, put the rope down down the from the first floor. <laughs> she, uh, she 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 came out just a big bottle of this skin cleaning alcohol. <laughs> just put it out. You had a party in the prison. <laughs> Can't get any better than that, right? <laughs> I remember that in communist prison. That was actually it was uh, really bad if they caught you with this. So. Mm. So you so you end up getting released when the Pope comes back again. They do this gesture. They're going to let you right. out of prison. Right. And then are you going, once you're out of prison, what, what are you doing? Um, trying to find a job first. So I said, I need to do something. I mean, my mom cannot, uh, she, she's in a hard time. She has a hard time too. And I, I cannot be on her sitting and uh, living on her from her money. So I'm trying to find a job uh, and you can't because everything is controlled. The government owns everything. They own the job. So if you, uh, I remember after struggling for a while, I still continue my training. So uh, this is what I described earlier. After the training coming out from the, sometimes in the evening, it depends wherever we train, there was police pulled in, they pull me out in the car, drive me around, threaten me for a while and just throw me on the street. So this is when I said like, you know what, I can continue like this. Uh, this is something that I eventually end up dead. And, the, and they did actually, we find out later that, uh, not later, I found out around the same time that one of the, my fellow prisoners uh, uh, was suicided. Then another one, I was like, well, I'm not going to wait maybe long. And uh, then the, my images of America came in. Yeah. So this is when I went and uh, I said, yeah, I need to go get some help. And uh, I went to uh, American embassy. I said, hey, this is what's happening. I need help. And well, hell yeah, it's like, sure, we need this, this, this. And within uh, three weeks, I had, the, uh, I think within three weeks, I had a visa out of Poland to Germany, to the United States permanent. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is that I also had to, because I was still in the age that conscription age, so they uh, had to go and sign up. Like, okay, I'm I'm not going to go to join Polish military. I'm 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 not being sold by the military or anything. And I remember I walk into this office and I say, hey, I'm I'm leaving Poland. I need you to sign this here. So this fucking sergeant just look at me, say, you look pretty strong. But uh, you know, people like this should serve Poland under this Polish fucking this Polish uh, symbol, this Polish eagle. I just like I say, dude, 
Hey, in the Polish eagle, that motherfucker, you and your Russian's body stole the crown from that eagle. It's a bar that, that eagle doesn't have a crown on his head. So that's your eagle, but it's not mine. I'm not serving out of this motherfucker right there. <laughs> and, but he already signed this. I just left. I remember I was leaving that building. That motherfucker was still screaming and yelling <laughs> after <laughs> how bad we are, how the bad folks people are. So, and I, I came to, to, to Germany uh, first in the little center that the United States created for us, for refugees. I learned about America. We had the people coming, teaching us about America. And eventually, I remember, still like, so where would you, what, do you have any preferences when you come to America? I remember I was always called, it was, I was in Poland. I was so cold that m- actually we, we didn't have, couldn't buy the good clothes. So my mom put the newspapers in our, sometimes in our jackets. So just like, just don't tell people, tell them anybody because then it'll be bad on me. But uh, uh, just have those newspapers inside, it'll keep you warm. And they did, they would actually did, did the trick. So I was always cold in Poland. And uh, uh, then, uh, uh, so when they asked me, I was like, well, everywhere where it's not cold. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it is hot, it's perfect, but just not where it's cold if you can. So it's like, well, what do you think about Memphis? Do you know anything about Memphis? It's like, no, but I know that Elvis Presley was from Memphis. I knew that. And like, okay, okay, so we're looking for the place in Memphis for you. And that's where I came in. That's when I landed in the United States with a 10 Phoenix in my pocket and bag of clothes. So you, so you, how long has it been since you left Poland? How long were you in Germany for? I was in Germany maybe three months. Are, uh, they, are they teaching you any English there? No, there was no time for that. There's mostly like, you know, the, 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 the legal stuff. What you need to do, how you go about getting uh, the English classes, how you leave, what, is the, what the laws are, what, how, how to be good uh, 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 a member of society and productive. So there's that we try to learn on our own. I just remember both myself the English dictionary and uh, that I lost somewhere on the way to so in the in the flight. And uh, but that was really good because cause like finally when we came to like a normal world, where everything was clean, everything was bright, everything was uh, nice. People were nice, and it's like. That's that's the world. I think that's what America is going to be too. So we really, I was really excited just to, to 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 you know to come to America at the time. What year is it? It's 1984 beginning. So I left 1983, like December 1983, and this is like beginning 1984. So you you get on a plane? Are you by yourself, or is there other people with you? There were some other people with me. Uh, there was uh, there was a group of people uh, refugees from the communist uh, socialist state and. Uh, but we were going to different locations. So some of them we I didn't even know. And uh, once we get on this big jumbo jet, it was like, I didn't even know who these people were, where they went. So I, I, uh, we eventually I landed in New York. And I remember I just wanted to see this statue of Liberty. It was like so great, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> you, uh, is anyone escorting you? Is anyone? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was like a, we didn't come on our own. I mean, when we came in, there was part of the people waiting for us. Everything was provided. That's they they, they help us to our destination, Memphis. I remember this is where I got my first apartment. They helped me get the apartment, my first job, and uh, I was so excited. I remember I, I I never knew what the air conditioning is, right? So I was watching that movies from America in Poland when I was young and I see those boxes in the windows. I thought they're just boxes you can put the milk inside, you know, the food because in Poland it's so cold. You just put outside the window your food, your milk, your stuff. So I say, this is so cool. They are so smart. You know, why in Poland don't have this we could have this box behind the window, we could put more stuff in it. <laughs> and uh, but then as I was learning there's actually the, there's not the boxes for food, it's just air conditioning. So this something that keeps your house cool and, and healthy. And, but I remember, so when I moved into my first apartment, I couldn't contain myself to tell my mom, say, I call my mom, say, mom, I'm living in the apartment and with climatization, with air conditioning. <laughs> She's like, what air conditioning? I say, it blows cold air if on demand if you want. <laughs> she say, oh my God, how much do you pay for it? Can you afford these things? <laughs> I say, no, yeah, it comes with apartments. <laughs> 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 so yeah, that was so, uh, I mean, uh, that, that 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 change was so drastic. I remember going to the store first time, grocery store, 
in Poland, it was very simple. Just grab whatever was left on the shelf and just run with it before somebody grab it from you. It's like, fucking, here you walk, you see the cereal. First, I didn't know what the cereal was. Like, what's this? Oh, this is like a cereal that this was. I don't know what it is, but I take one. But then you look at these boxes, they're all so looking cool, so nice. It's like, <laughs> well, try this one. Maybe I try this one. So I have like 50 boxes of the cereal. <laughs> then the, the, it was so the abundance of everything. Something I could not get used to it for a long time. I always end up buying, trying to buy maybe like five, six dollars groceries. I end up with like 30, 40 dollars. And I thought, damn it, spent all the money again. Because my first paycheck was, I think it was like you know, 40 dollars a week. So I remember, but of, of course people, I wouldn't be able to make it without Americans helping me. So they, uh, I remember this 40 dollars, usually by the end of the, week because i had to send money to pay for apartment it was like 180 dollars i think for apartment electricity and everything uh i had maybe like i ran out of money at the end of it so i just have to wait for my paycheck as soon as i get a paycheck it's more cereal more food you know people were bringing me food too so um again i would not survive you know the americans uh, helping me who was the who were the americans that were helping you was it a religious group it was, was it? a religious group okay. was, uh, uh, st grace look church in memphis and uh, these people are a, a, a Christians, and they help, they have so many people, and I think I, I'm I feel obligated. I, I need to do something to maybe reciprocate it now, kind of late, uh, but uh, they, they, those are awesome people, and they are they still there. They still actively support people coming to America help them settle down. I would never succeed if not their help. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, <clears throat> the funny thing is too that I didn't speak English. Mm. So they bought me a dictionary. And uh, and so I'm just trying to learn as, as much as I can. I remember one of, these, the, one of the families, like older couple, older couple, pick me up and say, okay, we're gonna drive you here today, show you this around Memphis and this. So as we drive, actually, this is them. They gave me the dictionary. So because uh, they, they were like, they were helping us. It was just that couple of maybe I think it was like designated to help us. So they gave me the dictionary, and I was like, I'm trying to show it. I'm using it, and I'm really trying to learn. And I see this black guy walking on the street. So I'm looking at the dictionary. Say, this is black man, right? So just looking, say, and the it dictionary it says, this is N. So I say, hey. This is an, mm. <laughs> it was like, she almost crashed the car. Oh my God, no, no, do, why do you say that? Where did you learn that word? I say, the dictionary you gave me right here. <laughs> so I have the dictionary here today with this lady still scratch that word and say, black man. You know, I didn't know any better. I mean, for me, I grew up in Poland. There was no, uh, no um, there was just only white people there. So I didn't even know about the animos how animosities. When we, the first black person I've seen, I was maybe like 16, 17 years old. I said, this is so freaking cool. I never seen a guy with that color of the skin. <laughs> so me and my buddies were like circling around. This guy, I'm sure this guy said, what the fucking weirdos? But we were like, holy shit, he's really black. You know, so I, I didn't know it. But there was never any sinister feelings. It was just curiosity. And I said, like, well, I want to be friends with them. You know, let's invite these guys to our club, you know? <laughs> and actually we did, that they show up. So we gave them Polish names. One was Yashu and one was something else. And uh, we became friends, you know? So but it was the first black people I've seen. So, uh, so, so you, do you go to any classes to learn to speak English or is it just work? No, just no, at the time uh, I was working already. So for they, the church provided us like short, maybe, I think it was a one month class of English where we uh, attend, you know, it's hard to learn. Was uh, it hard? Was it hard to learn? It, it was hard for me, uh, as you can hear it now, <laughs> 30 <laughs> years later. But uh, yes, that was, uh, it gives us some basics maybe. But I remember, you know, like pronunciation, good God, that was killing me. Uh, thank you. The, the, there's no TH word in Polish. So thank you for me to say it was like, I couldn't, I couldn't just could not say it. I was spitting, I was just uh, <laughs> butchering the word. <laughs> Probably a friend of mine comes in and say, hey, uh, just, you know, fuck it, just say thank you very quick. Say F instead of PH. Uh, they won't even hear the difference if you say it fast. So sure I did, you know, and I said, I remember there was some meeting or somewhere where this, um, this, I think there was a priest or somebody who brought the cookies. 
<laughs> so I grabbed the cookie and I was like, I tried to struggle with this. <laughs> Should I say this guy from behind? Like, <laughs> thank you. So it's like, it's like, fuck you, you know. It's like, <laughs> uh, f- uh, and it was like, got quiet. I was like, that's not right. Like, they say something <laughs> wrong. This guy was like, whoop, disappeared <laughs> behind. And it's like, and finally, the, one of the older gentlemen comes in. What he is trying to say is, and he looks at me and say, thank you. <laughs> I say, thank you. You know, I work on it hard, and so I'm better now. But I'm still like, that's my wife. There are words that I'm not allowed to say in public. So like, uh, sometimes like, hey, take my phone. Can you put the phone in your purse? It's like, don't ever say that loud in front of anybody. That's just uh, say, say my... My, my, my bag or something. So it's okay. challenging for you to say purse. Uh, purse. Okay, yeah, we're <laughs> not. We're <laughs> or, or a hamburger. <laughs> so uh, so uh, things like don't, don't I'm, I have a, like a little list of words that I'm not allowed to say, especially around my wife. So, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm doing that. So what was the first actual job that you got once you're on the ground, you're in Memphis, you got, a, you got an apartment, it has air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> What's the first the uh, actual the job? The first job was in the dealer, uh, was in church. I was basically uh, mopping the church, cleaning the toilets, and that was something to get me through, get me familiarized a little bit with uh, with, with America, with uh, get a bit English uh, behind my belt. And so basically I was working part-time uh, as a janitor, and this is where actually I start actually picking up English m- more. I remember I had a bucket, Mop in one hand, and I have a little cartoon, cartoon in my back pocket. So, and Joe is going to the store. So, <laughs> like, and Joe is going to the store. Joe is going to the store. It means that he is going to go and buy some groceries. I basically like in Polish, so mm-hmm. I was translating it. And uh, th- th- so I did more cartoons. I was picking up even more and more English, and. Uh, eventually, I think they decided I'm good enough to venture uh, find like a different job. So the church helped me to get a job with Oakley Kesey Ford, uh, first time in Memphis. And Did I was- say Oakley Kesey Ford? Yes, Okay. in Memphis. That sounded like a Polish word, actually. Uh, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had a relapse on me. No. <laughs> <laughs> we come back to it later, right? especially when I had to translate Polish to English and back. So um, in Iraq, but um, so I got the job up there. My job was to pick up the, uh, uh, the phone, and they already knew that there's a guy who doesn't speak English, but he knows the numbers. So they say, okay, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'll just write it down. I say, thank you, click. I run upstairs and I pick the part. There was five, five, six, seven, eight, and brought it up. So the, 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 the cars from different dealerships or whoever needed that part was coming into the door and pick it, picking it up. And I was just the guy who just take the phone call, get the number, get the parts. I was working really hard, but... God damn those numbers, I just kept mixing up. So there was guys coming up and like two hours later here, fuck, we just got the wrong part. This this is not the part we wanted to. The mechanic says that we, we just gave him a wrong part. So they come to me, it's like, hey, you know what, you're working so hard. We see it, we don't want to fire you, but you know, you just need to get better. But uh, do you know anything about cars, European cars maybe? I was like, yeah, you know, I had an idea, but yeah, yeah, you know, because there is an opening in another dealership and they are looking for uh, mechanics for Saab, Porsche, and Audi. Maybe, I don't know if you would want to go and try that too, you know, that's, I said, yeah, absolutely, yes, well, yeah, I, I know all the, everything about the cars. How many people, when you were in Poland, how many people did you actually know that actually owned their own car? I personally didn't know anybody who owns the car. <laughs> I know some people who knew some people who owned the car. But, uh, and, and now you're, but okay, so you're a car oh, expert. My, my, my father, point. because he was a communist, he, he was allowed, he owned the car. There yeah. you go. Uh, so, uh, but that was, the, that was the expertise that I had. Okay. <laughs> I know somebody who, who knew somebody with the car. <laughs> uh, so, so I went for the interview, and was like my English was so broke, I had like, even I didn't know what I was saying, but I remember <laughs> that uh, the, that so they brought there was like they, they needed a mechanic for Porsche, Audi, and Saab, and uh, so they brought the, the the foreman from the Porsche first. He he looked at me and like, and I know there's like blah blah blah, and I just like that we can have a guy guy doesn't even speak English. 
So the, 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 the Audi mechanic came in, he talked to me for a while, and I tried to say my best, but he's like, mm, I can see him can head, so no. And then the sub mechanic comes in, this big guy, like motorcycle gangster, and uh, walks in, she's like, looks at me, like, I take him, I need slave, <laughs> come with me. <laughs> As I started my career, I became good, I became good. This guy, I owe him uh, so much. Uh, he as uh, he was uh, he was running with the motorcycle gangs and uh, he uh, I remember he was a very proud guy and uh, and uh, but I was able to actually talk him into look uh, Jimbo we call him Jimbo look Jimbo I can't speak English very well but I need to learn this thing I have these manuals for sub if you can read it loud to me. Uh, I, I can record it, I can listen at home, and I can match the words with the recording. I thought he would kill me first time, say, hey, motherfucker, I, I am reading shit, I don't even know how to read well. <laughs> but then, <clears throat> then I, 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 I talk him into it, and he says, so we're sitting in his uh, kitchen, he would keep, he keep reading that manuals, and it was, I know it was hard for him, I could see it, I could tell it was hard for him, but he did it for me. So uh, we become like really good friends. And very often, you know, he came back drunk up there, laying under the car. So I say, hey, Jim, are you working? I say, yeah, he's working right here. I'm just helping him out right there, you know, to, to, to the management. So he's like, okay, if somebody comes in, just kick me. I'm going to sleep. I say, okay. So he's sleeping there <laughs> under the car. Great guy. Actually, this is the first time that I was exposed to American way, American way of eating, too. Because uh, so I remember saying, you, you know, you need to come over here. Uh, we'll have a steaks and I'll just. We'll just have a steaks and say, okay. So I show up and uh, there's a big ass, I think two steaks, no, three steaks with his girlfriend there. So there's big ass three steaks are like, fuck, we're gonna be eating it for a month. I mean, so like, <laughs> so uh, who, who else is coming here? He said, no, just three of us. I say, oh, what about the steaks? Yeah, you can have one. I mean, the one is for you here. You can pick whatever you want. I was like, I mean, that entire steak? He said, yeah, what's wrong with that? I said, dude, I'll be slicing it and slicing it just so that thing would last me for a month in Poland. And I, I just didn't know that you can eat just steak like that, just by the slab of meat, you cook it and you eat it. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I love steaks. <laughs> I'm addicted to steaks now. So, so that was how I was exposed first time. It's like, yeah, you eat the steak, you eat the steak. You don't, you don't just paper slice it like this. And the, Because in Poland, you know, there was... I didn't mention that, I just come back very quick to it. The, the, the socialism, what did to Poland is that once became me very resilient to hunger because I, I was going hungry to school quite often because my mom, you, had to, you cannot buy food for more than two, three, three, four days, especially bread or something. So if my mom didn't get up early enough around three o'clock, three thirty, four o'clock in the morning and stay in line, which is sometimes around the block, uh, to buy a loaf of bread, I didn't, I'd, I'd had no breakfast. So sometimes she was in line all right for a couple hours, but then they sold out bread before she could get it. I was hungry to school, going, going to school. But my remedy for it was, uh, I just find out those richer kids from those, especially those parties, party members' sons, they have always food, they have really good food. So I just beat them up and I took their lunch and I I, had, I ate their lunch and I said like, you want to eat lunch, you bring two sandwiches next time. So I had <laughs> so much supply that I, actually I was like a Robin Hood because I was like the poor guys that I knew up there and I was like, okay, uh, you bring the sandwich to this guy, you bring a sandwich to this guy and you uh, to me. And if they didn't, we just took their lunch and we just ate their lunch. And, uh, <laughs> they usually they brought the lunch, so it worked. It worked. Um, but, uh, so how, how long are you working at the, uh, what was it, the Saab dealer? At the Saab dealer, I worked for quite a few years. And uh, I think it was to the point that the war, the, 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 then I became U.S. citizen too. So for me, it was, it, it is still, it is the biggest accomplishment uh, for me. People think, you, you made to the SEAL training, how does it feel about it? Well, I tell you how does it feel to be American citizen. I tell you how to be American, I'm free man. Uh, that, that's the biggest accomplishment I made. That's not the SEAL teams. Uh, I'm very proud of the of, of the Trident. I'm very proud what I did in the SEAL teams, but it is not my biggest accomplishment. I always look at this American flag, and I'm American. I'm not Polish American. I am not something American. There is no hyphen in front of this American. I am an American, and I'm proud. And uh, so, yeah, that's... So you mentioned... Um 
you mentioned the first Gulf War, but then you, w- at what point, because I know you got into parachuting at some point. Oh, yeah, I was. Well, how did that happen? Yeah, I was, I was at the time, uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I met the girl who made the parachute jump. She told me, well, you know, it's like, you need to try it at least once. So I said, fuck, I tried it once. That was before the war, before anything. So I said, well, I just called the drops and I said, hey, can I make a parachute jump? I said, sure, come on over. That was in Memphis. So I came and said, how can I make the parachute jump? Well, you have to see through the classes, it'll be tandem jump. I said, tandem jump, okay. So I sit for the class, you know, that he explained me what to expect, what to look, we end up uh, and jump. Fuck, I was hooked. So I said, like, can I do it again? It was pretty expensive, but you know, being single at the time. So I, yeah, you can do it again. So I did it one more time. So I like, can I jump by myself? Like, not right away, <laughs> but you have, you have to go to the classes. So tell me about it. So the, he goes, well, so you go have a class, most likely like on the weekend. Then you go Monday, you come, you do one jump, maybe two jumps. Tuesday, Wednesday, like within two weeks, you get this uh, uh, enough jumps, seven jumps, it was AFF. Accelerate the free fall at the time. And uh, so you made enough jumps, then you can graduate to jump on your own. I say, fuck, and when can we start? I say, we can start actually this Thursday. <laughs> I say, uh, no, Friday. I say, okay. So Friday I came, I had a, all the classes. We made the three jumps. Saturday I made the next four jumps. And I was, uh, I think Saturday evening I was jumping on my own. So it took me <laughs> three days. I, I, I was hooked. So yeah, I, I was skydiving. Actually, this is funny because I, in Memphis, we jump from very high altitude, usually 12,000 feet, sometimes from 15, 16,000 feet. So, so though I had I accumulated a lot of free fall at the time. So I decided to go myself for the AFF Jump Master course. I said, I become the Jump Master. I will be teaching skydiving. And I did. And actually, I did extremely well. I remember when in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time, the only issue I had, again, with my language, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, you have to do class. You have to do class, you have to be very thorough. If you miss something, the instructors, usually those the USPA commission people, there's very experienced skydivers, they pick up what you miss in the brief, and they did that errors in the air, which you didn't brief, or you, you said it the wrong way, mm-hmm. you told it the wrong way. So we had an agreement, we, we were always partner up with, so with, with one of the guys, and we had an agreement, you know, if I ask you a question, you answer it correctly, so I don't have to, because if you answer it correctly, I have to reteach you, because these people who are watching, if I don't catch your error, what, your wrong answer, then they will go and do it to me in the air. So we, we are okay, so we are with that agreement. And you know, there is a, a point in the skydiving too, and we teach people eventually say like, so there is a, attitude that you have to make your decision. You either cut away the malfunctioning parachute if you have malfunction and open the reserve or you ride it to the ground. So I think it was that time it was 2,000 feet. So by 2,000 feet, you don't have a good parachute and you need to make the decision to cut away as a new jumper and, 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 and open your reserve. If you didn't do it by this time, most likely you just should be riding it to the ground. So we go through it and say, I look at this guy and this commission is listening there. And so, okay, now uh, tell me what is your hard dick? This guy looks at me, so like, what? I was like, you know, tell me about your hard dick. I said, I can't tell that. So now I'm getting him and I was like, motherfucker, don't fuck with me. What's your hard dick? And uh, he says, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, you know, the 2,000 foot hard dick. I don't have 2,000 foot hard dick. I was, I was like about to punch this guy. I look up there and this hole is, they're, they're laying under the tables and laughing so hard. I was so focused that, you know, it's a 2,000 foot hard deck. Deck, deck yes. and dick for me, it was yes. kind of like the same, same thing. So, so, so he, he didn't tell, he said nothing about 2,000 foot hard dick, but uh, eventually, I gra- yeah, and, but I graduated from this course, even, uh, even regardless of this hard dick. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I was skydiving by this time, but when it seems Persia, like uh-huh. it seems like coming from Poland, coming from not having food, from being in prison, from all these things that are going on, it seems like when you get to America, you've just got this this like drive just to live and make things happen, and you're going to free fall and you get it done in four days, and then I'm going to become a jump master, and you're working as hard as you can. It's like you have this 
open freeway in front of you for the first America. time. This is You can be whatever you are able to be. You know, I can't say I'm the, whatever you want to be because I, I want to be astronaut. I'm 60 years old. I ain't going to be astronaut out of me. But, <laughs> but, but you can be whatever you are able to be. There is nothing to stop you. Like different countries. What's your background? Who is your mom? Did you do, are you communist? Or are you belong to socialist party? So we can help you. But if you know you cannot be in these positions, you cannot go to, to, to college even if you don't have if you are not part of the socialist youth organization so so for me yeah there was like the entire world open i could be whatever i was able to be and there was nothing stopping me so uh, even more uh, uh, even more makes me uh, that stick to my word i want to be the best citizens i want to make this country the best can be and and, and contribute to it so that's where the first persian war came out and i just became u.s citizen at the time so I was like, okay, I can't build the jobs for these people. I'm not rich enough. I don't have resources, but I can fight for them. So this is my country. I'm going to go and sign up. I had no idea how to do it. I remember in post office, I seen those draft cards sometimes that you, you fill it up. So I say, Pah. I went up there, I fill it up, I send it out. I packed my shit. I was living with other skydivers at the time. So they said, what, what, what's going on, Drago? Where are you going? I said, I'm going to war. I, I, I just sent out my papers. And this is and this is the first Gulf War. First Gulf right? War, So yes. it's 1991. One. Yes. The first Gulf War kicks off. Yes. You want to go fight. I want to go so fight. So you go yeah. down to the post office. And I filled you out. grab the, uh, what's that thing called? The, the selective the service Selective service, service. yeah, yeah. You yeah. fill that out. Send, send it, it in, pack my shit, pack your bags. Pack your bags, and that's right. <laughs> anytime now. <laughs> so, uh, well, nothing happens. The guy's like, Drago, you know, I don't think this is the right way to do it. But, uh, but you, you, you should, surely want to go into war. Man, there's a war going on up there. I say, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you have to help. This is, I came here with nothing. And everything I have, I own to America, to this country. I need to do something. And the best way I can do is go and fight for my country. So, yeah, that's, uh, I'm waiting on the Vendor Simulator. Uh, uh, sorry, but this selective service doesn't apply to you. You are too old. So I was already 31 at the time, going 32. And um, so I said, fuck, uh, yeah, I, I, find my, I, I will find my way into that war. So... But somebody said, hey, why don't you go to recruiting of recruiting office? I said, oh, sure. I went to the uh, army. For In Poland, army is everything. You know, so this is like army. Uh, you're talking about army, air force. For me, at that time, was, everything was army. So I go to army and say, okay, this is me. I would like to join military. I would like to go to war. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I fight. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, no, 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 we like your jobs or something. You have any skills? I say, um, no, not really, but uh, I will doubt do whatever you tell me to do. You know, I just want to go to war. I will, when the war is over, I will go back to my normal life. But I, th I think just for the duration of the war, I would like to join the military. They say, okay, well, well let me see. They look at my documents and they tell me what to bring. So I bring all that stuff. They did all the, all the work. Say so, so okay, so we put you as an infantryman. I think it was infantryman and stuff. And I say absolutely, thank you so much. I'm I'm ready to go anytime. And then uh, seals show up in our drop zone. They were doing demonstration jump, mm -hmm. uh, leapfrogs in uh, in Memphis. So we start talking about it. And we jump a few times together. I say like, they're such a cool guys, you know. And uh, so they um, yeah, it's like but you know before they joined the army why don't you try the navy just go and ask recruiters about seals i was like seals what's the seals like, yeah but the navy yeah, there's cool guys you know i'm jumping they call themselves seals so i'll just go and ask hey i went the next door i said like i'm applying here for army and they have all my paperwork but i met some friends who told me to ask about the navy and the, i'm just asking about the navy who those friends are i said like they're calling themselves seals oh <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, you can be a SEAL. <laughs> it's like, but you need to get those paperwork from these guys. We put you in the Navy, and uh, you're okay. Then, then, then we'll just put you in the Navy. You, you will be a SEAL then. I say, okay. So I went the next door. So like, hey, it's basement. I'm going there. So can I have it? <laughs> they were pissed. They did not like it. But So anyway, I got my paperwork. I show up up there. They looked through my papers. 
And they're like, well, you know what? We can guarantee you the seal. The dif- there was a diaper program mm-hmm. at the time. So we cannot guarantee to you because you are way too old. You are even too old to qualify for the seals. But if you sign this paper here, you join, you go to boot camp, they will make you a seal. There's not, no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. So I say, yeah, sure, totally you know, that's you okay. <laughs> I say, okay. But they say, but now before you become a seal, you need to get a job. You have to select the job in the Navy. At that time, there was no SEAL rating. You remember mm-hmm. that there was a, you, you, you go to boot camp, you get a, a, uh, go to A school, get a job in the Navy, and then you go to, if you're lucky, you, you, you are assigned to go to SEAL training. So I said, well, I don't know much what I want to do. I'm parachuting something with, how about being parachute rigger? I said, sounds good to me. <laughs> so I had no idea what it was. It stuck me in this field for like, as an E5 for years later. But I said, like, okay. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, make me see, uh, make me a, uh, at that time I was dating a girl too. So they say, okay, but if you want to go to that school, to PR school, uh, you will have to leave this week. You will have to leave on uh, uh, Thursday. We'll put you in the uh, delay entry program. And I think uh, you'll be sworn on Thursday, you will leave on Friday. I believe that was, I think that was like short notice. So I called my girlfriend, hey, we need to get married right now because I'm going to the Navy. I'm just like, what? I said, I'm leaving to the Navy. I'm leaving this for this weekend. <laughs> so we went to the judge. We got like you know, stamp, we got married very quick. And uh, then I showed up on the, in debt, got uh, sworn in. And on Thursday, I left to boot camp. And didn't become the, 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 there was like no intention to make me a SEAL. No. <laughs> but you know, for that time, I didn't really care. I just wanted to join military. I want to contribute to the effort. I am American. I want to fight for my country. So whether being the parachute rigger or whatever, I just made the best out of it. But as the opportunity shows up, I say, why not to be a SEAL? I, I, I try it. And I did. I passed all the tests. So that was in boot camp? In they, boot camp. They do that. They do that day where they go okay if you want to try for seals you need to go take the test right now yeah there is a there is like a day that they actually there are different jobs and there's people that are coming and telling about their jobs so there are seals eod motivators show mm-hmm. up and he talked about i just couldn't sit in this fucking chair to, <laughs> just get out and just hey yeah, yeah yeah i want to go um so and now you're th- are you 32 years old at this point, at this point, thirty-two years old. I think. What yeah. the f- what the hell kind of physical conditioning did you do throughout your life to get to get there and be <laughs> in like good enough shape? Because they don't even let guys go to buds when they're twenty-seven or twenty-eight or something like I that. Know, now. I guess I got beat up a lot. And I, <laughs> I just got conditioned. By did that. you did you work? Were you working out this whole time? Not really. I didn't know how. I didn't know that the, the physical uh, demands of the SEAL teams at the time. I was just like. What about, that, just, what about just in life, swim. though? What about just in life, like in <clears throat> like when you were when you were working at freaking saw kickboxing taekwondo? Yeah, that's that's that was just basically what. Dude, you're a mutant. Uh, you're a freaking <laughs> mutant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just can't consider myself lucky that you know I was able to. The, and you know the test is really not that difficult to pass. Yeah, uh, that's it's, true. It's still it's still something about yeah, if you don't prepare yeah. you fail, but. Um, yeah, so 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 just so people know what you're talking about, you say the test isn't that hard to pass. The bait, the seal test that we used to get to get a chance to go to seal training yeah. was like, I think it was you had to do it's some minuscule. It's like fifty push ups in two minutes, 50, 50 sit ups in two minutes, yeah, eleven eight pull ups, ten pull ups, eleven like eleven pull ups, and then a mile and a half run in eleven thirty, and a mile and a five hundred yard swim in eleven yeah. thirty. Yeah, so, so it was something like that. My struggle was with the swim, which I couldn't swim very well. So, uh, uh, but I took it. I got it. You know, I, I passed it. So I'm so happy. I'm like, oh yeah, this is so cool. And then I fucking got a kidney stone. A kidney stone? Yeah. In oh, the that's right, because you're a freaking old man yeah, there with the, a kidney yeah. stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they get a kidney stone, and uh, and uh, I remember they that was so freaking painful. I mean, I never had, wasn't I was never beat up so hard. That was so painful, like like this. But uh, that was so painful that. I remember they gave me that medicine. I think it was Demerol, and it's like it didn't work at all. I said, I need something stronger because uh, I, I just I'm, I'm I'm about to go crazy. I'm, I can't. Uh, that pain is so so hard. So they give me a morphine and just like went away. But I remember this funny thing because the first time when this up, I had no idea what it was. I was laying in the bunk in the boot camp, and this, as this pain came in, I just fell off the bed. And so they turned the lights on, and within like three minutes, I had this pool of sweat. 
right under my nose, all dripping. I'm on my force. This medic comes in and says, hey, are you okay? It's like, fuck, do I look okay to you? I, mean, I can't move. I say, well, so, so they got me to hospital. I passed it, but that was not the worst thing. The worst thing is they told me, well, you know, you're going through this medical thing. We're about to give you the medical examination for seals, but you had just had a kidney stone. You have to wait a year. It's like, fuck. But, you know, my mindset was, I want to fight the war in any capacity. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that I have that privilege to go and fight for America. So uh, for me, it doesn't really matter. So I said, yeah, that's, that's okay. And so then I went to A school, and the A school I met, uh, uh, rest in peace, uh, Les Barrios. I don't know if you knew him, but. So Les Barrios, uh, he was a motivator in Millington when I was going to the, my parachute school. I said, look, I passed the test. Um, I think I, I can easily pass it again. But I had this kidney stone, and I cannot. I, I just want to be a seal. So, w- is any way maybe there's some maybe paperwork can be done? He just looks at yeah, paperwork. Yeah, I think you can. Just go get your medical record from your uh, for, uh, from your medical office. Bring it here. We we'll take a look at it. So I ran up there and I said, "What magic you'll come up with? I'm sure there's some paragraph or some regulation that will allow to bypass the stupid kidney stone." So I brought this record. And it's like, yes, right, right there, right there. And it's like, yeah, yeah I just, just, I want you to leave the room here. I'll, be, I'll just call you in a second. <laughs> and I could hear, rip. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so he calls you back. So the kidney stone, uh, where is that? I was like, right. Oh, so he, he likes, I don't see any. I said, I don't see any either. You sure you had a kidney stone? It's like, you know, maybe not. <laughs> uh, maybe I didn't. Okay, well, you didn't. So, And uh, I graduate uh, from A school in Millington. I think one of the second top. I, I, you know, everything that from boot camp, I graduated top recruit in this whole batch. I, was the, I got the Military Excellence Award. I was like a first, very first recruit, actually, uh, uh, to, the top recruit from that batch graduating. A school, I graduated, I believe, the second uh with the second highest score. So I, I, I had s- things going on for me, and then I was waiting for my orders. He said, okay, I send it out for it, hopefully it gets approved, and sure, three months later, got my orders to bats. So that, that's the rest of this, rest of it is a history. <laughs> <laughs> you show up at Bud's, what was uh? What, was there any major challenges for you? Was like you said, you were not not a great swimmer. How were you on the rest of the water stuff? Well, the 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 problem was that I could swim only on one side. I never swim with the mask on. So you know, they dump you in the pool and say, "Okay, I want you to swim here. This is a side stroke. Side stroke. This is how you do it." And but you'll be swimming all the styles that would tell you to do. And I was kind of okay with it. But when they put them put the mask on. After the first couple laps, I thought I would pass out. I mean, I was like hyperventilating. I was blacking out. I see the black spots in front of my eyes. I'm about to die here. <laughs> but I said, like, if I stop, they kick me out. So I ain't stopping. I say, I know that if I pass out, they will rescue me. That was those guys everywhere. They tell us that we are safe. So we are safe. So you know, I was blacking out. Like, fell about to black out, having these black spots. But it became easier and easier. But I think by the time, like the next hour, I was like. Shit, that ain't that bad. I Wait, can do it. So what is it? Just like some weird, like claustrophobic thing on your face or something like that? No, I couldn't breathe through my nose, uh, and I couldn't breathe. Know how to breathe through my every time I took a breath, I've sucked the water with it. <laughs> so uh, I think I, 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 I was breathing water and air at the time, and I was coughing, I was suffocating, I was, I was basically drowning. I felt like I'm drowning, and uh, it's just I say I'm not going to quit. I, 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 I just. I pass out and see what will happen if I have to, but uh, I didn't pass out. And, uh, um, I got better actually by the time there was a fourth phase. There was a pre phase when mm-hmm. before you class up for the uh, for the seal training. So by the time I, we graduate from the fourth phase, move into our real seal class, the instructors asked me to demonstrate the new guys how to swim the side stroke. So I, I became really good. 
I was never a fast swimmer, but I was a strong swimmer. I could fit, f- swim forever. <laughs> and you didn't you didn't come up with any injuries or anything being a thirty three year old guy going through buds? Uh, not at that time. Uh, the, the the worst thing I was, I was always tired. I was looking at these young guys like, hey, let's go to the bar. <laughs> I was like, dude, I can hardly move. I can't go to the bar. I was, I was, I'll still make it out to the bar here and there, but. That, that was just like r- really painful for me because uh, again I was not the intensity of it. It's not just the one time. Mm. It was like one time, like uh, seal training. I think most of the people that one day can like yeah, he he may survive, but it over and over and over. It just wears your body, wears you down, and eventually you, some people quit. So that was the most difficult for me because uh, I did not recover as fast being 32 years old as uh, as other guys. So what was your first? What were your first orders? What team did you get? I get to SEAL Team Two, and uh, actually, they they uh, I wanted to go to SEAL Team Four because I say, I don't want to be called. I know SEAL Team Two at them at the time operate the the, the north part and the, of the Europe and in Europe in general. So I say I just want to go to like Team Four. But friend of mine said like No, 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 dude. You with your language, with your Polish, Russian, and you, I, I speak Japanese too. So uh, with with your languages, you be good asset in this uh, uh, European team and stuff. So I kind of like put the so I switched it from the team four to team two. I put team four second, and just like God, please don't put me in SDV. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I just for some reason I don't know. I was I was not maybe that technical person at the time, and the challenges. To be a SDV operator is twice as it is as twice. You have to be a SEAL, but you have to have that expertise with these mini subs and with the the operation of it. That uh, for me, I felt was overwhelmed by that. What you need to know to be good operator in the SDV teams. So um, so I uh, I chose two and I got my orders to SEAL team two. Went to boot uh, went to jump school. Uh, did you go? To, did you go to Fort Benning? Yes. Uh, for me, it was kind of fun time because, uh, you know, like when I was growing up, I was poor. I never had a chance to go to like a Disneyland or s- s- this type of thing. I could watch over the fence how children were playing around it, but I, I couldn't afford it. So when I got into this tower, I was like, holy shit, this is like a Disneyland, you know? <laughs> so I didn't care what the position they wanted me to jump. I was just like running out of it and like, woo! And yeah, that's, um, they kind of didn't like it, but they, uh, but they are very rigid. So I remember too, those, that I had a lot of fun too because uh, there was, wha- wha- I think you went through the same thing. Yeah. So <clears throat> there is a, there is a the Fort Benning, so you stand next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, so close that basically you just you cannot even move. And then you just go to, to your line, you grab the line, they drag you, you just do the PLF. I could never do the PLF, right? I was always scared of PLFs. So, uh, but anyway, I found out that uh, if you like tip one of them from one end, it's like a domino effect. <laughs> those army guys, they would just totally fall down. They would save them after they would fall down. And that was actually, I thought it was, ama- uh, um, that was amusing. It's like, this is pretty cool. You, know, you tip one a little bit and the last guy just plops down. Um, my, but my issue was that uh, I don't like PLFs. So I made so, def- so just so everyone knows, a PLF is a parachute landing fall, and it's a technique that you get taught for static line jumping, where it's supposed to minimize your injuries because you keep your feet and knees together, and you hit like you kind of like roll. You sort of roll when you hit, and you keep your arms kind of tucked in, and it's supposed to prevent you from getting injured because when you're on a when you're on one of those parachutes. You're still coming down really fast. It's not like uh, what you see in the movies when guys can kind of come down on a free fall parachute and they flare and they just kind of, kind of tiptoe away from it. You hit pretty hard, especially if you're a heavier guy. The heavier you are, the harder you're going to hit. So they try and teach. And plus, the army's working with hundreds and hundreds of people getting thrown out of that thing, uh, thro- getting thrown out of an aircraft every day. So they try and teach the most simple way that they can teach hundreds and hundreds and of people how to fall without getting hurt. Now, I also was not good at the PLF. Yeah, uh, scared the shit out of me. So I just, uh, I try one time and just pop my shoulder and I'm like, fuck, I ain't doing it anymore. So every time I jump, I just stood up. I just, I, 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 uh, it was not a big deal because I had hundreds of jumps <laughs> at the time. So I just jump out, just really land, I just stand up and I was like, <laughs> so it's like, they had those, those black, black hats, yeah. they had those tubes. PLF, 
PLF private, PLF, PLF, I want to see PLF. I was like, Roger did. And so I grabbed my, threw my parachute and just roll on the ground. Like, I can do those PLFs, you know, that, 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 they, they don't hurt. The other one I kind of, uh, so, so that they, they knew from me, from not, not listening too good. Uh, yeah, those PLFs, they were killing me, so I didn't do them. <laughs> and, uh, I avoided them. So you but, get the team too? And what, what, uh, did you get put in a platoon right away or did you go through SQT no, first? No, we had, to, we had to, I had to wait for SQT. I had to wait for STT. That, at that time it was STT, yeah. uh, serial tactical training. But, uh, when I show up in the Thames, you know, like you, you are the new, new sailor. I was a new sailor. Everywhere I went, the boot camp, the, to A school or, uh, you know, the, the bats, everywhere was so formal. So, uh, so, you know, I buy the book and everything. So. I show up and by that, like, I don't even know where, like, five minutes later, I'm hanging on the pull up bar in my blues and fucking doing pull ups, <laughs> running three miles, fucking that. I do my PRT in my thing. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, what the fuck? By the time I even, you know, realized what's going on, I had I completed the whole PRT in my blues and stuff. So <laughs> was, they were just like with the new guys. Yeah. You know, you just so, show up. So, so, so what he's talking about there is he shows up. At, in his dress uniform, when you check into a new command, you're in your dress uniform. It's yeah. the nicest uniform you've got. And you don't, you know, normally you'd wear it for like a ceremony. So he shows up with that uniform on and they're like, cool, <laughs> we're going to do a, a physical, uh, physical, what is it? Physical, PRT or so whatever. What does the R stand for? Physical, um, Something readiness, test. Physical, physical readiness test. test. Yeah. yeah. So they got to take a physical readiness test. They even tell me that hey, they just say get on the pull up. Yeah. You do the pull ups. So you go for the run. Now push ups. <laughs> go sit ups. So, you know, I'm sitting up, doing sit ups in my dress blues. It's like everything was so shiny. You know, I spent all night just making sure that there's like yeah. no no wrinkles, no nothing. And here I am. This all is ragged up. So anyway, I, I finished that. That's the welcome to uh, the, welcome to the teams, new guy. Uh, that's yeah, what you're getting. Yeah, but you know, I just I said that that's okay. I guess this is the the way it goes. Here, the teams, so <laughs> I roll with it. And the the, the bit, another surprise for me was um, I remember. So we came in. There was a couple other new guys at the same time. So when we show up in the team, and they said, "Okay, hey guys." At that time in the in the teams on every Friday, we had a kegger in the high bay. So it's a keg of beer and. The guys were drinking beer, so hey, with new guys, we just invite you for the kegger, you know, just I'm sorry, you need to come and join us for the for the kegger. So I remember I was so taken, I was like, these old guys, these old Navy SEALs, they are so cool, you know, take these new guys, they I invite for the beer and stuff. And <laughs> well, I didn't know that we were there just for the amusement of these old new guys. Then as soon as we did that, not sooner that we just crossed the door of this bay, we just get beat up taped up, hang up in the, on those fucking chains up, <laughs> hanging like a bat, while these guy are, guys are drinking beer and just throwing the insults on us and stuff. So, hey, you know, it's like, once if, uh, but, you know, I have to be fair, once every while they lower us down, they stick this tube in our mouth from the dragger, <laughs> just pull the dragger into the, uh, beer in the dragger bag and just squeeze it as fast as you can, so like, coming everywhere. Just, so by the time, you know, you drink so much beer that you didn't care if you hang it upside down or not, it's just, <laughs> Uh, as long as they didn't leave you overnight hanging, and that, that, it didn't happen. So, so now I realized that this is that we are not there to f just uh, fraternize, frater how to say, it, to fraternize, fraternize with mm -hmm. the old seals. We are just there for their amusement. As a new guy, so they call us meat, you know, <laughs> fucking new guy. I mean, geez. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah. That, that was the, the welcome to the team. So, but you know, that's uh, I, I, I look at it, I figure out that's the way it goes. So. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. And I was waiting for my STT, getting beat up here and there, and uh, <laughs> and then uh, that was fine. Uh, then we got to STT. And STT, pretty much, pretty straightforward? Pretty straightforward, but with me, there was, like, so there was me and another guy, Sc Scotty Linton, a great guy, I love this guy. Um, he left the teams uh, uh, later, but... Uh, so those two of us, they were a bit different. Uh, I remember, so we went through STT, everything went, you know, I had a little bit problem with my English because I still have mm -hmm. to translate everything, all the commands. You, 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 you should and move and you, you, know, you communicate. So far I had to just go and uh, translate this in my head in Polish then and uh, be fast enough to do it and, and react to it. So uh, it was okay. So when they w eventually came to the crypto and uh, the, the, the radio communication equipment, uh, you know, the communication class, and went to crypto, and we are sitting there. By the time we were about to take a test from this, as I, I was thinking like last like two more days. So, the, so today was the last class. You know how to use the cryptographic equipment, mm -hmm. how to use all, all that stuff. 
and uh, so the the next day is supposed to be uh, I think a final exam, and then there's just, just like the, then move to the next section of STT. So this guy comes in, and one of the instructors comes in, and it's like, hey, uh, do you have a clearance? It's like I don't know what it is. So most likely you don't have it. Do you have a clearance? And Scott like, well, I, I'm not even U.S. citizen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Come on with me, you know. So we end up there and said, like, don't. So we like, look at us, like, don't ever say anybody that you went through this class. You just don't say nothing. Don't say anything. You 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 never sit in that class. It's like, okay, you guys get your clearances, then go. We we redo it, and uh, so. So yeah, we just see that. So next day we see our guys watching, running through the field, you know, with the equipment, setting it up, you know, doing the crypto stuff. Mm-hmm. And and I was watching it, I was like, shit, I mean, that's not that difficult. I could pass the test now. Science already already went through all this class. I don't know what's a big deal, but I guess they don't want us, they don't want anybody to know that we sat through that class, not having the secret clearance. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, I eventually got my clearance. So I went to the radio shack upstairs in the SEAL Team 2 and passed the test. Uh, Scott Linton eventually got his citizenship. So we all went, whole platoon went up there, I guess he was in the platoon by this time. <laughs> and he got his crypto stuff too, and uh, we moved on. <laughs> so then my first platoon, is, uh, I, was, uh, I remember my Chief Bixler, good God, I think. If this guy didn't have a heart attack yet, I think he might, he will have it because of me, because you know my English skills. So it's, uh, they were not really that good. So it reflected on everything. I mean, we you know whatever you do, you know you have to communicate. You have to communicate fast and very effectively. And uh, I just was lacking that English skills at the time. The funny thing is, finally I made it to this platoon. So I was not anymore a fucking new guy. I was not anymore this uh, meat. Uh, and we. Uh, I remember, so when you come back from press platoon, or get back from the platoon, from deployment, you're always like, hey, I got this school, I'm going to sniper school, I'm going to this school, I'm going to this school. So I said, hey, Drago, so what school did you get? You know, just where, where are you going? It's like, ah, dude, I'm going to English 101. I think the next door up there, this fucking uh, the regular Navy thing. And uh, so I spent the next three months doing actually English classes. That was not bad because actually, it helped me in my career in the future. So basically, what so they legit sent you to English school. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, and uh, but that saved my career. You know, these yeah. guys were apparently they seen something in me. They say, well, you know, he bachelor English language, but were, were, were you having a hard time like communicate, like in the, going through the house and stuff yeah, like, like that? Going just the, yeah, going trying through to the, communicate yeah, with the rest of the guys. Yeah, especially the communication, going through the house and co- trying to communicate. Yeah. So th- at that time, I was still had to. I still had to. Tra- I didn't tell them that, but I had to translate from what I hear to my Polish thing. Then I had to think of the solution, translate back, back. to English, and say it. Okay. So uh, I, I, I managed that. But it is so much easier later on when actually I get my English good. So that is just flow, you know. But I still have to be very fast. I have to be very fast. What was your What was your position in that platoon? Were you a gunner, uh, sixty gunner? I was a sixty gunner. Yeah, I was sixty gunner. I think for the next three platoons. And, uh, <laughs> it's just um, no, I liked it. You know, yeah. I think it's a big, you carry a big stick. You easy to load because you don't have to worry about just jamming this little pea shooter magazines. <laughs> you just put the tape in it and say I'm good to go, and then we get to roll. Where was your first deployment? Was it to Europe? Uh, yeah, it was in Europe. That was at the time. Uh, actually, we deployed to uh, San Vito in Italy. Okay. And uh, that was when the uh, O'Grady got shut down. Actually, we, we were looking at him, and you know, this actually becomes, uh, brings to my mind too. In SEAL teams, you do every day you do something that can kill you. I didn't think about it, but it does. I remember flying over the Adriatic Sea where we were actually on the lookout for this for uh, for uh, this pilot, uh, Scotty Linton. He was sitting in the in the he was a sniper, so he's sitting up there and uh, uh, f- uh, fucking with his gun. And we look at it, and I think it was Bill White. Look at say, fuck, say nothing. His whole belt just dropped off. So he was sitting on the ledge of, uh, I think it was- Who, the, Scotty? Yeah, Scotty, yeah. Oh. So the ramp is open, he's sitting on the ramp, fiddling with his gun, his whole belt is gone. So he just like, I think it was a, I think it was a Bill White. He just like, sneak up on him, just grab his ass and just fucking pull him inside. It's, it's kind of like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's like, dude. You almost fell out of that shit. <laughs> because you know those clips, they yeah. were like easy to come and do. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it, it's, it's not really something that I would say safe, that, that they will stay 
calls on you. So yeah, so the, so that was the thing, and uh, yeah, there's a, it comes to my mind. There's always there's something, there's some situation that you can get killed. And if you look at the statistics, I think from the before the war, I think we were killing like two guys in training every year. As the average, I think it was like. When, I, when I'm looking out, this guy died, this guy was killed in training, this guy was killed in training, it was like one or two guys every year. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, there's definitely, you're doing stuff every day, whether it's yeah. parachuting, diving, shooting, you're always doing something, something can that that can give you a bad day or make you fall out of a helicopter because your belt came off. Yeah. So did you guys, did you ever do any of the work down in uh, in Bosnia? Yes, we went, uh, there was my, another platoon. We went to Bosnia, to Yugoslavia, we spent time that was pretty good time. She was like, it was just good. There was really not much to do at mm-hmm. the time, but just work out and get big. <laughs> so that was a really good platoon, actually. There was, that, this is where I met the strongest guy, I think, in the team. So I, uh, I, I think I, I can think of uh, Chris S. I, I don't know if I can bring his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have a permission. I didn't ask mm-hmm. him, so just to be on the safe side. But he knows who he is. Mm-hmm. When we went to France, France, I mean, this guy was lifting, like, what, five plates, uh, the, the bench bench press. So when we went to France, we just got the fr- French equipment. He just bent that shit out of the hell out of their their their, their bar, pry bars. When he picked it up, this pry pry bar, the, I mean the the bar bent, and those weights f- start falling off. So all these French guys, they stop working with us. They just like whenever we rolled into their gym, they just sit down like a bunch of the you know, weird dudes. <laughs> so that they uh, that was actually funny. <laughs> but yeah, there was big platoon. I remember it. So there was entire platoon, I think, over 220 pounds. I, I think there was one guy, maybe he was not, but like all of us was over 220 pounds. And of course, Chris was way much more. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's. I remember for me, I, I wanted to say, I need to join this 220 pounds. So I'm working so hard and I'm just like a half a pound below, half a pound below, like 219, 218. I say, Fuck, give me that loaf of bread right there. So I was just like, I weigh myself, maybe I, I have these few grams to get to this 220 pounds. I just chow down, push myself into that bread myself, like get on the scale, 220 and a half. It's like, fucking <laughs> I'm to 220 pounds club. <laughs> now I wish I could get to the 220 pounds from the other side, from the top. <laughs> so then, what was it when when I showed up at Team Two? What was was that your fourth platoon? Yeah, I don't remember. I, I think so. Or your third, fourth platoon. or third platoon, maybe. I think it was your. fourth. Yeah, I remember you showed up. And it's like I remember I had the swim with you. This is before even we platoon up. So mm-hmm. we just we did dive that that swim, and I said, "Well, you are a kind of big guy, so I don't think you'd be swimming that fast. So I think I'll, I'm safe with you. I'll be all right." And you say, "Okay, he look, you, I mean, you look at me. And say, okay, that's your boy. You, you swim with the boy.'" And I was like. Okay, <laughs> and uh, so we get in the water. Fuck! You drag that buoy, you drag and drag me and that buoy <laughs> with you. I just could not keep up. I mean, there was like, where this fucking guy is taking the well, strength from? I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't be. You're so big, you shouldn't be swimming that fast. What were you doing? Uh, like a recoil dive or something? Yeah, I think it was a like, recoil dive. Yeah, there was just like swimming from one place to another, just a couple of legs here and there. I think it was a recoil dive. So I remember you dragged me and that buoy to the fucking water so bad that I was like, I think I would just over breathe that goddamn rake. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but if, yeah, we made it, so I said, I'm good. <laughs> and, it, and so then we get put in the platoon and um, yeah. we had a freaking go- really good workup mm-hmm. out there. Oh yeah, that was good workup. That was a really good platoon, good deployment too. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, this time we went to, Spain, we, we, we hijacked the Russian tanker too. That's, that was, yeah. that was a, you know, now it, when I look at the back at it after my experience in combat, I'm sure you too, it's like, it's not really that big deal. Yeah, yeah. But at that time, there was like, holy shit, we not only hijacked the Russian tanker, <laughs> uh, Volgonev, there was Volgonev. <laughs> we, we fast rope on that thing. Yeah. Uh, I remember the funny things too is, uh, you remember we were doing shifts later because it was a Russian tanker, mm-hmm. so there was na- regular Navy. And, and just to clarify one. everyone for, for the English translation, when, <laughs> when, when Drago says we hijacked a Russian tanker, mm-hmm. we actually didn't hijack a Russian tanker. There was a, there was a tanker, a Russian tanker that was smuggling oil out of the Gulf and one of the missions that we had while we were over there was stop people from smuggling stuff out of the Gulf. Most of the time we were taking down little little dows, little tiny boats, and we would take those things down. We took down a bunch of them too. Yeah. But then mm. this was the biggest catch that we got, was this big oil tanker that we 
that we Under took Russian down. Flag, yeah. yeah, with a Ru- Russian flagged tanker that we took down, we got control of, we turned it over to the the authorities. But um, so we, you know, we didn't hijack it, but we did well, assault it's it and vi- take visit, it down. Vi- 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 visits and search, <laughs> right, visit right, boarding right. and search. There's yeah. an acronym. There's a name for it. But you know, bottom line, we hijacked the tanker, <laughs> so we got it. And um, and uh, I remember <laughs> the funny thing is, you remember we did the shifts later, right? Because yeah. Navy was not comfortable, so let's keep seals on it. So just bobbing on this boat, you bobbing on this boat, and. The, but I remember, so when we took it down, we came back and died. Then the next shift came back next day. The, the, the other squad, when they came back, say, dude, you just left a bunch of weapons with them. There is so much. Fuck, we took all this, uh, the weapons that you guys left. I was like, what weapons did we leave up there? I mean, we searched that boat. What turned out to be is when they went up there, they see those little butter patties, mm-hmm. the butter knives butter and knives forks. And they just fucking took it away from these guys. So when we went back, these guys are coming in. That I spoke Russian, you yeah, remember? Yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah. they say, hey, uh, mister, uh, please help us. We have no teeth and we can't eat because these guys stole our forks and our <laughs> knives. So we can, I cannot chew. And, and uh, they, they said, I have like really maybe two or three teeth sticking out of the mouth and this, like, that's all they had. <laughs> so we, I remember, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we take care. So we actually bring those bu- butter knives or butter, what do you call it, spatulas, <laughs> and, and forks back to them so they can actually eat. Yeah, I also so. remember those guys. They were telling us that we didn't do a good job clearing or whatever they were saying because they still because we were like, oh yeah, they have they have butter knives and stuff like that. And then they're like, don't worry, we secured it. Yeah. And we were sailing. We were on a navy ship looking at the ship that we took down. And I'm looking. I was like, yeah, you did a good job. And I looked over and there's like a fire axe. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was axe on every door. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, good job, you idiots. So they stole their fucking uh, butter knives and forks, but leave the big axes and I say, hey, you guys left this all this weapon. Here, look at this. Look at this butter knife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that, that was, was crazy funny. too. Because l- just by sheer luck, our platoon commander went to the naval academy and studied Russian, and so he spoke Russian. Yeah, we had another guy that was like uh, went to Berkeley and and he studied Russian, and then you. So in a platoon, we had three Russian speakers yep. when we took down a Russian vessel. Yep, that's freaking lucky right there. Yeah, that was awesome. I, I remember just at the very beginning we busted the bridge, uh, and, and I remember this captain say, "Hey, uh, don't cooperate with Americans. He's in Russian. Like, don't don't say nothing. Don't operate. Uh, resist as much as you can." Uh, Mr. Fionda, he understand it. He was our uh, OIC. He said, "Drago, take care of it." He said, "Just grab the guy by the scrub, <laughs> working up, open the." I was got a big chimney with the door. I said, "Open the door." It's like a little, little tiny space. <coughs> so I told him the Russian, "Like you motherfucker, you just say another word. I'm going to squash you right here and lock you up for the rest of the journey." <laughs> he just looked at this l- little tiny space. Say, "Oh fuck, I better don't fuck with these guys." Uh, okay, so like, no problem. And we never had a problem with this guy again. So yeah, that was that was a good time. Uh, um, but I tell you, I have to say one more thing here. I, I remember you remember Robo. Neil, he was in my in our platoon, my fairly good buddy, and at that time we were like best friends. And uh, I remember he was a sniper on this op, and he said, "Drago, I ain't going to happen nothing to you. I'm 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 looking over you." And I remember as we moved through the ship, as we searched, I said, "I I know Rob is up there. Ain't nothing shit is going to happen to me. I know he'd take down the, anybody who's on our way." So it makes me like very comfortable. Yeah, that was. Um we had a bunch of, we had a tight group. We had a good group. platoon. Yes. And also you were talking about being big. We were also, oh, yeah, we, we were. also, we, we tried to get a platoon average of 200 pounds and we had to make up for some slack because we had some guys that were like 150. <laughs> we did, we did. <laughs> and we, I remember we got to, uh, we, the first place we went was Spain. Oh yeah. And yeah. I was trying to get to 250. Yeah. And I could I the same thing. I was like trying, I'm eating, I'm lifting, I'm squatting, <laughs> I'm eating. And I was I couldn't get above like two I don't know, two forty five or something like that. And then where we stayed in Spain was a, they had an all you can eat buffet for all three <laughs> meals of the day. Yeah. And I was like, yep. Oh, I got this. <laughs> and like three days later, I was two fifty. I weighed in and I was like, Yeah, two fifty. And then I went on a four mile run. And I was like, okay, I need to lose weight. This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no shit. But you remember we were living like our doors were opening right on the beach. So we just oh, yeah, opened the ridiculous. door. You just walk on the sidewalk. It's like, I'm on the beach right there. It's like, that was awesome. I mean, uh, that was awesome deployment. I really like that. And uh, then the Bahrain. And uh, uh, there was the 
the Christmas party, I mean, the Christmas time came, the New Year came, and kind of like got us tighter and close together, mm-hmm. too. There was the 2000 year, so that was really, really good time, and I have very fond memories of it. It's almost like a very nostalgic to me right now. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Um, so we get done with that platoon. I know I got back, I, I went to college, you carried on, um, where, did you stay at team two or did you go to I, a different team? Uh, uh, no, because I think you remember when we came out, we came out as a, uh, in 2000, uh, as, a, as a platoon from SEAL team two, we came back as a SEAL team four, at least some of us. So they, they remember the division 2000 that went oh, blind. Oh, that's right. Right, they made some adjustments to the yeah. way they were structuring the teams. Yes, and so when we got back, you, you I was team four. You went to team four. Okay, yes. got it. So all the all these uh, uh, upheavals and all that stuff. Eventually, I ended up in one of the platoons that uh, were the uh, we deployed to South America. We were in Puerto Rico, and we we're like three months into deployment. When they uh, they call me, my chief calls me and say, "Hey, um, Drago, we." Uh, you will go to Baghdad. Just want you to pack your shed. You need to help facilitate the Polish Grom <laughs> with our guys. Uh, where were you? Where were you when September 11th happened? I was, I was seal team two, on SEAL Team Two quarter deck. I was actually watching it as it happens, and I remember I was working out. I was in the gym, and they say the airplane hit the tower. So I was like, "What the fucking idiot!" Some just flew into the mm-hmm. thing. But then I'm, as, as, as as the you know the news progressed, and they say like there was a not there was a jetliner. It was not the small airplane. I just put my attention. I say that's. That's something. That's something wrong here. And then the second plane hit the tower. I remember, and um, I, I still have a hard time thinking about it. It just brings me all these memories, and and the, the, I was watching the towers collapse. So it just brings tears to my eyes. I can uh, I can't think about it. I just at that time I just want to go and kill the savages. Um, so, so as you're now now fast forward a little bit because you're back on deployment. You're mm-hmm. at Team Four. Yes. You're in Puerto Rico. Yes. You're probably going completely insane because you're in Puerto Rico yeah. instead of being either in Afghanistan or Iraq. Yep. And yep. then you get a call. Yes. And I tell you, make jealous everybody in the platoon. So how the fuck Drago got this? You know, sales. We are aggressive. There is a war. We want to be in the war. And yeah. Um, so I was like, "Fucking hey, this is just incredible! I am, I am so damn lucky. I can pass it, like chief. I can pack my shit right now. I can leave. No, 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 no. Just go, go pack your shit. Just take your, take your stuff. There's a, you know, orders here. Blah, blah, blah. So they say, what will happen is we are like, I think like half of deployment at the time. So we'll just go for another half, another three months. Just help settle down the things, settle up the grom, come back and join another platoon and do your work up and." So I say yes. I was so excited, and I was like, "Fucking, I landed in the bag that." So, I, so just so everyone understands, so there's a there's a Polish special forces unit. They're called Grom. What does Grom mean? Thunder, or is that just uh, the call uh, sign? Uh, uh, it is a call sign, but uh, you know you can translate Grom actually as a thunder. It is thunder. It's but thunder. This okay. is a acronym for uh, actually Grupa Reakcyjna. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't say this. Uh, so it does. It does stand for something in Polish. It does stand something, but Polish, it also yes. means thunder. It means thunder. Yes. It's so, like a seal. Seal means like an animal. Right. 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 Animal seal, but it's not really what it is. Yeah. So. so so the Grom, the Polish Grom, had deployed to Baghdad. They were actually co-located with the seals that were also in Baghdad, and they needed someone to be a liaison between the Polish Grom and the the seals that were there. And of course, everybody kind of knows or had run into or someone knew that there was a Polish guy or a American, an American guy Polish. that could speak <laughs> Polish that grew up in Poland that was in the SEAL teams. They track you down, they give they they contact through your chain of command and boom, yes. you get the call. How long did it take from the call to they you you fly over there? I think it will. A week or a couple, uh, few days, so because you know I had to pack my stuff. I had to, I still had to process my uh, orders, and um, yeah, I packed my stuff. It was a, a, a fruit civilian aircraft to. It was funny because I have all the guns, everything, <laughs> and I'm flying civilian aircraft to, uh, to Middle East, and eventually um, I landed in Baghdad. Yeah, it was uh, 2003. Oh wow! I, the, the heat was incredible. I th- uh, when I unpacked my stuff, I just stood up. It's like that that. 
uh, wind blew. I was like, fuck, what is that aircraft here? I thought I'm like in the jet blast of uh, some, uh, you know. What jet. month did you arrive? I think it was May. May. So yeah, that, that was hot. It's not even hot yet. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not like, even hot uh, yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like June, yeah. it's gonna come. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then July and August, it's on. So, but even May, you're like getting there, like, oh, oh yeah, why is yeah. it so hot here? I, I, Where's the I, I jet thought, engine yeah, blasting on me? Blast of the jet engine. I look around and it's like there's no. It's just the just the wind. <laughs> so you so you you show up. You get to ch- camp Jenny Posey. Yes. Uh, they, uh, so they they get me to Jenny Posey and. Uh, I show up and so you know I'm getting briefed, and uh, they like okay. So this is what we expect from you. This is what needs to happen. So, so uh, this is where I raise my first alarm. I say I'm going to sit in the fucking Humvee and watch shit happens. Uh, uh, I'm here. I'm going with these guys. If they, if they go, so you know the, for the command, our safety is priority. So they were like you know well. We don't know these guys really. We, we we know they are good, but you know we don't train with them. Mm-hmm. We didn't train with them that much. So, we if we set you loose with these guys, I mean, you taking a we are taking a chances that you can get hurt. Mm-hmm. But I said like, I had no other way. I said I'm, I'm I'm going with these guys. I mean, I I won't get any respect even from the, mm-hmm. I wouldn't respect myself just mm-hmm. sitting in the home doing nothing. So after a little debates, they say, okay, you can go with these guys. So for me, it was good because I was double dipping. I was going with the Grom guys and then I'll just switch my gear and just go back with our guys. By switch your gear, you mean change your clothes? Did you wear the Grom uniform? No, 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 no. I wore our uniform, but uh, change my, you know, like if you use the oh. magazines or yeah, the, yeah. the small reload, or stuff, refit. reload, refit, sure. and go with our guys. Sometimes on the fly, on, we were on the fly because like we're, we're at the time it was with Team 5. So the Grom hit the target, and we moved to another target. I just switched the cars and go with the power guys. So I, I, I got some of those missions. I think it's pretty good. I think <laughs> freaking living the dream. No kidding. I mean, <laughs> this was like so. That's why you know, like three months came in. We're supposed to return. It's like I hear nothing from my command. So like, fuck, I ain't saying shit either. <laughs> so I keep going. Actually, they ask, say, who wants to stay longer here because they, they, we have this change, but. We could appreciate any change, you know. Like, I like, I'm, I'm here, <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, I, I stayed, and uh, like four months passed, like nobody says anything. Five months, like nobody says anything. I was like fucking happy as I can be. I said, I ain't saying shit to these guys, <laughs> and uh, so like in the eight months, so this was like eleven months de- deployment, almost a year. Uh, my NVGs broke. And I say, like, guys, I, I need some help. Can you guys loan me your NVGs? They say, well, yeah, we can. And, you know, as a platoon, when we deploy, our little gear is limited. And mm-hmm. we have the, something that can support the platoon, us, but not to loan some other guys. So, you know, it went for a while uh, while I was trying to call my team. I say, hey, guys. Uh, so I finally I get call my team. I say, I need the NVGs in Baghdad. So this guy is like, listen to it. It's like, what? I say, yeah, can you send me any VGs to Baghdad? Who is this? I said, Drago. <laughs> so you want me to send equipment to you somewhere in Baghdad? I say to Campos, yeah, Camposi. So, and who, and who you are? Say who, 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 you, who the Drago you are? Who? I was like, I'm just Drago. You know, I'm SEAL team guy. I'm team guy. It's like, dude, you don't even speak English. <laughs> Do you want me to send the suicidal bomb vest with it too? You know, just like I was, uh, basically, they thought I'm just Iraqi trying to solicit mm-hmm. fucking gear to send to somewhere to Baghdad, and uh, so I got really pissed. Uh, like, dude, motherfucker, I fucking kill you when I get uh, when I come back. And uh, and uh, but anyway, get me master chief online. So they put master chief online. Say, so master chief, I need to get some NVGs. I'm here, my broke. And say, wait, 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 Drago, where are you at? I say, I'm in Baghdad, master chief. It's like quiet for a second. I was like, uh, and uh, how long you have been there? I said, I'm like almost a year on deployment. And uh, dude, you need to come back here because uh, you know, SEAL team such and such, I don't want to bring the numbers here, yeah, yeah. is about to deploy and we are next. You need to come back. So, uh, it's like there was no way to go around it. I mean, I, c- I could win eagle maybe so much, but at that, that time, yeah, I had to come back. So they, they sent me, I, I come back to Little Creek. And uh, <laughs> the funny story. So the, then the next team is coming out. So I say, hey guys, I can go. At that time, you get addicted to that stuff. I mean, you just you can't live in normal society. You're just like, dude, I just left there. I, I I don't like this place here. So to to, to live like this, I want to be there. And uh, 
So I said, well, I go with you guys. Yeah, we can use you. you know, just help us settle down with this. You already been there for so long time, and you are with Grom, so will help us. You you will help us settle down with that stuff with Grom and. So I went that so Jeff will take you for a couple of weeks. And uh, for me, it's like, yeah, that's awesome. It's a couple of weeks of it, as much as I can get. So we flew up there, and it's like four months later, it's like, hey, Drago, you need to come back, dude. We are deploying two months <laughs> or so something like this. And then uh, you need to be back to join your platoon. So I said, oh, shit. Okay, so I'm, as Master Chief, I'm on the way. So I came back and turned around and came back again with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with my with SEAL Team Four. The funny thing is that I, on my on my the, on this last tour when I was there, the, the, the army guy comes up to me like I don't know him from Adam. I was like I never registered even the guy. He comes up, hey dude, have, have you been here in two thousand three? <laughs> I say yeah. Have you been here in two thousand four? Yeah. When did? Did you ever go home even? It's like, well, for a little time. But dude, actually, I remember seeing you for, for all three fucking years. And I said, well, if you see me that long, you have been here quite some time too, you know? These guys are doing awesome jobs. So uh, the army guys, you know, it's oh, a yeah, pleasure, sure. pleasure to work with them. But um, yeah, that, that was like, that was like, yeah. And um, yeah, that was, uh, that was my, my Iraq time. Uh, um, yeah, I miss it, was, it. it was interesting, like, when we were there together and just to give everyone an idea of what was going on so the Grom there would there would be uh, intelligence from various sources coming down and we would kind of go out and capture kill bad guys and sometimes sometimes we were basically rotating back and forth between Grom and the, pl- the seal platoon Grom seal platoon and sometimes it would be two targets and we just go out together and or if it was a really big target We'd go out together and maybe Grom would be external security and the seals would do the assault or maybe seals would be external security and Grom would do the assault and I, I, I Don't remember you're gonna have to correct me, but I Don't remember many of them speaking English uh, not many at the time. Now everybody, everyone speaks and speak, speaks very well. But at that time, yeah, there was only me and uh, who. Uh, this is why I was. For me, it was great because I was going on the missions with them. I was doing assaults and the uh, and the storm the, 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 the hideouts with them and with our guys. So just yeah. a, a, a lot of the thing. But yeah, they they did not speak English at the time. A lot. Yeah. So so what I remember is. Like we would give our brief and you would stand there and translate the brief for them and then they would explain what they were doing on their target and you would explain what they were doing to us. And then anytime that we were, you know, if we were if we were kind of doing something together, you you were really critical for making the the connection between what the two elements were doing. It was freaking a pretty big job. You know what, there was, uh, it was, I think it was important at the time, but eventually we meshed so well that I remember sometimes was called, hey, guy, hey Drago, is that guy, is the Grom guy or is our mm-hmm. guy? So I can say, that, that's our guy. You know, it was, it was hard to tell who is who because we're working so well together. Um, yeah, but you know, the, talking about this English thing, uh, uh, translation and stuff, I am also, I think the, m- besides being breacher and breaching uh, in Iraq, known for my English skills, actually, um, for my, um, I, actually, I, I'm going to patent it. I'm thinking about patenting it. Uh, I became known for being the fastest English language uh, instructor, teacher to terrorists, actually, because I developed that course. I call it Drago's Accelerated English Language Course for Terrorists. Basically, you give me five minutes with a terrorist because they always say, remember, I, I don't speak, no English, no English, mister, no English, mister. So I say, I teach you. Five minutes later, the guy actually could speak with better accent than I could ever say things. So that's, uh, that's I, I think that I'm very proud of my skills. And uh, so that's, that, 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 I'm thinking about patenting it eventually because that's, you know, it's, it worked so well. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was awesome too. Like when I, when I said that the translating between us and the Grom, you're right. Like we'd be out on the target and we wouldn't, there would be very little that you would have to translate because we all knew what the mission is, knew what we were doing. We would interact very well together. And just like, just like SEALs, I mean, when you're out on a SEAL operation, you're not t- talking a bunch. Yeah. You're, you're basically, especially on those types of missions, you're barely saying anything. So it was, it was not like you were all the time having to translate. 
But there was a couple times, or or there would be times where it's like, oh, we need to know what they're doing. What are they doing right now? Hey, Drago, where are they going right now? Yeah. It's like, oh, they saw a guy, they saw a squirter, they're going to get him. I'm like, cool, Roger that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just just taking care and and bringing those two units together. And man, it was an awesome working relationship that we had with the Grom. It was freaking awesome. They were great guys. I, I really enjoyed that work because, uh, especially there, you know, we have all the same ROEs. But the interpretation of these arrows was well, maybe a little bit more loose or not so strict. So well, they, they were strict. They were they apply everything that needs to be applied to ROEs, but they were also realistic about that stuff. So uh, there was pleasure to work with them. Uh, the funny things was that if I mix it up, you know, I had that switch, I had the earphones, the peltors with one connect to the Polish mm-hmm. Grom, one to us. So if I switch the wrong, wrong way, and it's like, Drago, <laughs> god damn, speak English, motherfucker. <laughs> or then I switch the other one, Drago, we don't understand shit, you just say, speak Polish. <laughs> so I had to be very careful, you know, you, 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 you can do things very fast in combat, and then you have to just switch this thing the right way, because if you switch the wrong way, it's like, okay, we don't understand you, what? we don't speak Polish, Drago. <laughs> <laughs> so you were there for 03, you got there in May, you're there 04, you're there my whole deployment, which was yeah. from uh, 03, like, to right uh, yeah, like October to 03 or something like that. And Fall then, of 03 to to spring uh, of 04. And then 05. And then you you went back for a little bit? Did you go back? Yeah, I went back with my platoon then. I came back to SEAL Team 4 and uh, we are, the SEAL Team 4 was deploying. And then uh, came so back I again. Back, yeah, I came back again for another six months. So That, that was pretty cool. Uh, the, the thing is, you know, what... What it does to uh, is, I remember it becomes almost unreal, this world here. I remember uh, I was talking to my girlfriend at the time and say, hey, um, I, I need to go, I need to go home, I'm tired now. So it's like, this is so stupid, this is you not home, your home is not there, your home is here, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, <laughs> Oh shit! Okay, well, whatever, you know. But the the, the reality is that uh, that place becomes your home. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, when you think about this this world, about people working on the streets, making groceries, it becomes a dream, almost like state. That's just like, yeah, it is there, you know. But like now, you hear the fa- you, you, when you think about the fairy tales, some you know Snow White or something. It sounds really great, but but it's just like a fairy tale. So for me, this world become a fairy tale. It was just like a, you know, it's there, it's awesome, but I'm here and this is my reality. And that went almost like a dream. You know, sometimes I was slept, I was dreaming of being in normal world. And, and uh, uh, yeah, th- so that's, that became, that, that world here become very distant to me, become uh, almost unreal because there my reality was the war. And I liked it. I mean, that was the, at that time I thought I liked it, but I have to tell you because you know my job. I was I'm breacher, so I remember after at the end of deployment, so the the first deployment, I, I started having a problems reading. I couldn't read, so I remember trying to read the sentence, and my eyes were jumping. So I had to reread it over and over, and, and then when I finished reading it, I don't remember what I started the sentence with. So it took me sometimes a five, six minutes to get through a paragraph. Mm-hmm. And I think this is because of the concussion. Uh, I mean, we are exposed to these, uh, to this stuff. And I did a couple times that I, you know, like we, we we're supposed, to, we are going explosive breach through the door that we looked at the Intel pictures and there was like, yeah, okay, okay, so this is how we plan, you know, we, we, we prepare all the, the briefs. This is where we hide. This is where the assault element is going to be. There's a breacher. So this is where we're going to go blow the door. This is how we go. Well, some of those pictures were not very accurate. And I remember around the situation that we had, uh, uh, I had a, the, the, the assault team stashed there. I went, sent the breach charge. With, with the guy came back and uh, I had no place to hide. I was like, fuck. This. And you remember most of these, uh, 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 most of these, uh, uh, buildings or these uh, hideouts were fenced off. There, the fences and stuff. So, once we climb inside, there's really no place to hide. And I had to blow my sh- that shit pretty much on myself. It's like, oh fuck, I, I, I can't hide. I'm, I'm not going to make a ruckus running for looking for the, some place to hide. So I just took a knee, put the gun in front of my face, and fucking blow this shit out. 
it, uh, I remember, I didn't remember much after that. I mean, I got my force uh, on my four, my legs, and I was bleeding from my nose and ear. Then, uh, I, but what, what kind of like, always puzzled me, it's like, what the fuck is my side? I mean, I have like, the bruise like fucking broke my ribs. Where that fucking came from? So the ground guy's like, the, dude, you are on your force. We just have to kick you out of the way because <laughs> there's no way to hide. You know, you, just, you were just you, you were just there on your force. And uh, we had, so basically they kicked me out of the way. The kick was so strong that it almost broke my ribs. But, you know, this is it's normal. It's not, that's something that you accept because that's... Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, as, as a breacher, man, but those, those operations, like those breaches that you guys were doing, and I would usually position myself where I would be kind of, with there'd be a wall, I would sort of put myself on top of the wall, on top of the ladder, so I could see the breach, I could see the building, I could see if there's any enemy movement, and then, right as you guys would say, turning steel, yep. I would duck down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm we'll ducking down, that too. I, I'm, actually ducking, I'm actually ducking down behind the wall because there, there could be frag and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and, oh yeah, absolutely. But, but you guys were inside those compound walls, and you're probably, whatever, eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet yep. away from the blast. And so, I, like I said, I get a little little bit of protection and I don't feel as much concussion. The concussion's going up. And then as soon as the breach goes, I jump over the wall and go, we go do our thing. But, you know, you guys are just taking that breach on a nightly basis, taking that hammer yep. to the brain. And, and look, I know there's some of them where, you know, it would be really bad and it might knock you out. But even the ones that don't knock you out, even the ones that you just, oh, you just, you just suck up that thing and it doesn't knock you yep. out, and then you go, yep. that thing is not good for you. Like those breaches are not good for you, and who knows how many hundred, hundreds of times you just took that, took that concu- took that minor concussion, and over time, it's definitely gonna, it's gonna freaking leave a mark. Cumulates, yes. Uh- we were, but as, as you know, we were not aware so acutely of the issue right. then as we know now what it does to you. And uh, you, you, you're right, you learn. You, you, you get, no, you, you get uh, sure, 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 shaked. Shaking, get, shaking, shaking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you get, it's you, like you, you get thrown off, off the sometimes off the ground. Just your, your feet go up in the air, right. sort of the blast. But then you just go in, you move on. You you are, you are out, out to autopilot basically you know what to do you train for years to do it so this is what i like i say i was so effective I, I i enjoyed that skills i could apply as an avc also that's uh that was uh that was great feeling but yeah well. it, it does and well, not that great feeling you know when you get no, knocked I, out or bleed from your ears and nose but uh but uh, just the 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 the, the tactics and techniques that how effective they are and how well they work so. yeah well, when you said good feeling I, I was just thinking about like when I got to Baghdad so you'd already been there for a long for I don't know uh, eight uh, months, I think, yeah months. eight months but I remember just being so freaking happy to see you and I was like <laughs> yeah, we do yeah, yeah, you look out because we already did a platoon together yeah. we already had awesome times together yeah and yeah. I just was like and you know so what, freaking that, that's another thing to going with your platoon I, I think this is for some reason this I talked to other guys we feel fucking safe it's like dude shit is not going to happen to us nothing is going to happen to us I think I, I think because that that the way your platoon was fired up the way you were fired up the way it was uh, I, I mean I think the leadership has a lot to do with it how you feel about this uh, that they've given up and uh, for us, it was just like fucking. I can operate like this forever. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about when you when you get back home after you spend all these months and months over there. And you were talking about how the the concussion, like you're you're trying to read, and you see the the freaking words are moving around, and yeah. you get done with a sentence, you can't remember it. What did you, when when that when that first started happening to you, what were you thinking? I was thinking, keep it quiet, because they will move me out of the platoons, they, they, will, they, will let, they won't let me go to war, so I just keep my mouth shut and say nothing. <laughs> so are, did you go back into another platoon at this point? Yeah, there was, there was after the first, uh, the first deployment, uh, sorry, so I did two more uh, combat tours with that. Uh, but uh, coming back, talking about the returning uh, from the, it was like almost a year uh, being deployed. I remember I landed in uh, Norfolk and um, the guy said like, okay, hey, 
go ahead and uh, you want me to help you something? I had all my gear, you know, all the stuff from Puerto Rico yet because I just came back from, I went to from you know, basically from Puerto Rico to Iraq. So I had to get my old gear. So I stuck my gear in the curb. It was, uh, it was cold. And I was so tired, I remember. Uh, but I said, no, don't worry. These guys are coming to pick me up, so I'm good. So he left, shut the door. There was, like, nobody there. You know, the Norfolk uh, mm-hmm. the military airport. And I fucking fell asleep. Just, like, fucking getting dark. I'm freezing my ass off. I say, what the fuck? I don't know. For a second, where, where am I? I said, I'm in Norfolk. What, what motherfuckers didn't show up? So, like, my phone is dead. So I was like, fuck, I can't even call them. It's getting fucking night and cold. There's nobody there. So I was like, hey, I tried to knock on the door. Hey, hey, uh, can, can, I need a phone. So uh, nobody shows up. I was like, I'm so fucking cold at the time. I'm just saying, I need to get inside because I'll get hi- hypothermia. I grabbed this fucking big concrete garbage thing. I was about to swing it into the window. And this guy was like, no, no. <laughs> opens the door. I say, dude, I need to make a call. I, I, I said, These guys didn't show up. So so I, uh, I, I can't, I could my phone is dead. I can. I don't even have a phone. I don't remember because my brain is already so messed up. Don't remember uh, the number to group. So call the team. There was a weekend, so that team is not there. Uh, call, call the group. So uh, I say, hey, uh, I, somebody's supposed to pick me up today, a few hours ago, and I'm still in the parking lot. I say, who? The, and, who and you are who? I say, I'm Drago. Wh- uh, where are you coming from? I say, I'm from Baghdad. I said, fuck off, you, you, we don't have anybody in Baghdad yet. We, you know, we are not even there, you fucking idiot. <laughs> and just fucking hang up. They thought they are just, uh, I don't know what they think. I said, that, so, uh, don't, you know, group two, there's not, not necessarily SEALs mm-hmm. on the quarter deck. Mm-hmm. There's like anybody who are the logistic people. So I call back again. I say, hey, motherfucker, give me your OD, the officer of the deck. I, mean, I need the officer of the deck because I need to, I just came back from Baghdad. I need to get back to the teams. So he say, they call OD, and I uh, say, hey, this is Drago. I just came here for a few hours ago. He said, the guy's supposed to pick me up. He said, I don't have to pick anybody up today. He just looked, oh, hey, Drago, we are so sorry. I'll just send the truck right now. So <laughs> the, the, we, we, are on the, we are on the way. So, yeah, they sent the guy. The, the tech came in, and um, great guy. I really liked him. Uh, so he, he, he came in. They load my gear. We got to Team Four. They took my guns away. So they they, they put it away. They um, all my gear. I just unloaded in my cage. And I saw something just take me. Uh, something came to my mind. Like fucking, I haven't. Uh, by this time, the girlfriend left me. She just said like, "You you are done." She called me on Christmas. Say that she needs to move on, and I'm. She don't have a time for this shit. So. Uh, so I'm like, she had my car and my stuff, but I had so I have no car. The car is parked somewhere in her place. My 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 clothes are there. It's everything I had was like cruise bags worth of things, but was in her place. So I said, I will just get fucking. I take this key. I stole the key from the one of those pickup trucks outside from that store. I just like borrowed it, and I'm glad I did because uh, the guy woke out. We woke out outside. He shuts the door, and I say, Hey, what's the code? I need to get inside. He so said, you guys are still sleeping in the fucking teams, in the cages. You can't do that anymore. There's new regulations. You are not allowed to go sleep in the teams. I said, I have no place to go. He said, well, tough shit, man. Um, he left. He just jumped the kind of left. I was like, what the fuck? So I tried to remember the, the, the code. Uh, I don't remember. I can't, I can't remember it. So we have those little punching things. Mm-hmm. On the, because they stopped the quarter, like, uh, do this uh, mm-hmm. some time ago. And... Uh, so I can remember it. I said, like, fuck, but I am so hungry now. I just need to do something. I just need to go grab something to eat. So I, 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 I had no money, but so I put my credit card, not credit card, but the, I didn't have a credit card, but the, my ATM card, it's like maybe $15. So uh, I was like, fuck, I just need to eat something. So I got the $10 out of it. So what can I just say? I hope. So I drove to, in Virginia Beach to I hope. Uh, that's by the, I think there was the, at that time Borders bookstore. And I came up to this uh, thing and um, I started, got me those uh, cheese blends. I love cheese blends. So that's from the, from the I hope. So I got me cheese blends, got me a coffee. I said, now I need to go find, and I got so sleepy, so tired. I just fucking fell asleep up there. And then next thing is the guy, the security officer comes out. I say, hey, what are you doing here? I mean, you are sleeping here. I'm watching you are here for like over five hours or so. And this is like, like I think, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I was like, hey, you, 
I mean, what's the problem? I was like, I'm looking at him. I'm still trying to get that uh, my wits together. He looks at me. It's like, yeah, the bitch kick you out, then she. I was like. <laughs> Yeah, the bitch kicked me out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I said, "Do you mind if I just go relax tomorrow morning?" I'm uh, today morning. I said, "I'll just go and uh, you know, I'll, I'll just buy some more food if I need to." Say, "No, no, no. It, you're fine. Just go relax and uh, you know, just don't cause any problems." I'm sorry, no, no problem. So in the morning I woke up. I slept in the. I hope so. I woke up and uh, went to group two, got some phone calls, and most of the guys were, I think, team four at that time. They were doing something because they were ready to deploy we were ready to deploy mm -hmm. again so uh eventually i got hold of somebody and um, then i got the code back to the team and then i realized like it's not only me there's a bunch of like, team guys there's, a bunch of, there's always some team guy sleeping in the cage because he gets <coughs> kicked out from the house his girlfriend kicks him out or <laughs> has the, this problem or has that's no place to leave for sure so so you know it's like i moved into the in the cage and uh that was pretty cool because the platoon had you have all the cable tvs you have a shower you have a gym 24 hours seven and uh, so it was not only me but it's like a bunch of guys hey drago you should just bang on the door somebody would come out and just open the doors for you i said i didn't know anybody was here we were told that we cannot that there's nobody in the teams anymore that thing is gone no nah, fuck this so we just uh, <laughs> playing cards and doing uh, all kinds of cook that was cool it was really cool and then you know we just uh, we deploy again but then uh, i deploy again but that was the first uh, my first comeback was not only that but then i find out that my checks start bouncing i look at the bank and they say no money at all i said what the fuck so i go to them and they say drago you didn't fill your travel claims so travel claims i was in iraq we told them we're not supposed to i was not moving anywhere i was there for like eight months nine months and the, you we were told not to worry about the travel claims well we just garnish your money, so you aren't getting any paycheck. You're just getting maybe like three hundred, whatever that that proportion was that they allowed to leave. So I said, "Dude, I'm so fucking sick and pissed of it, uh, about it." Uh, and uh, I'm, I, I, I tell you this: I'm just going to make me a sign, uh, Iraqi veteran. I work for food, and I'm going in front of that fucking gate up there and start get some money because I need to eat. <laughs> So uh, I said, no, no, you didn't, you didn't go that far, you know, it's just, we loan you the money. And actually the chief mess uh, actually loaned me the money so I can buy some food and uh, pay some bills. I, of course, I paid it back. But I was so mad, I called this, uh, the, the, those civilians that worked the travel claims in group two and just laid it to them and they show up, I yell at them. So, you, uh, so next thing the chief calls me, hey, Drago, yeah. Uh, you're not allowed to group two. You have, uh, they, they call provosts, and I think we have a problem. So we just told them that if you show up in group two, you'll be always chief assisting you, and you go with chief up there. So because <laughs> you really scare these people up there. I was like, oh, okay, chief, that's no problem. And um, and you know, just work my way, work my way out of this. Uh, pay my some pay those travel claims. You know, fill the travel claims. They did re return some of the money, and um, and it was all good. You know, that's. Uh, um, that's then I deploy again and again, and uh, the this with the eyes. First, I was uh, I was coming with all kinds of theories, like maybe my eyes are bad, maybe the tent is dark. So I use the flashlight, I use this, and I can't fucking read. So uh, it just I just give up. I say maybe I'm just not smart enough, and I just like move on. I was busy with other stuff, so, so it came back later. That uh, how many more deployments did you do? Uh, three. Two, two more to Iraq. So, uh, when, what year was your last more, one? Two thousand five, two thousand three, two thousand four, and two thousand five. And then, what did you do when you got home from from that deployment? From that deployment, uh, you know, at that time I also really you know uh, before you even jump into that, I, I just like there's a certain transition period, and there's a there's like a you know when you're overseas, and especially for you. You have one, basically one purpose in life when you're over there. Like yeah. you get it, you get your mission tasking. You you figure out what the what the plan is. You get your gear together. You brief the guys. You go out. You do your hit. You come back. It's the simplest life. Yeah, it's a, it's like a customer service, the government customer service. I would look at it. But my customers were always bad, and I got to kill them. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, but you come home, and all of a sudden, there's all these other things, right? There's the freaking yeah. travel claims, yeah. and there's like apartments, and there's all these other things that you gotta try and like deal with again. And and sometimes just that is you're just not 
it takes a little bit of time to get used to what you were saying. You were saying that the normal world doesn't really exist anymore. And then when you come back and you get injected back into it, sometimes it takes a little time to get used to, okay, there's this, this is what, this is what I've got to deal with. I got to go stand in line at the DMV, like a normal freaking human being, which I have, you know, let's face it. If you, if there was someone in the way when you're, you know, it's, it's like when we were, when we were doing operations, when we were driving, if there was a vehicle in the way, you freaking just knock the vehicle off <laughs> yep. the road. Like you go yep. plow it out of the way and then you drive on. Yep. If there's a person that's in the way as you're moving towards a target, you just freaking clear them out of the way. It's just no factor. Yes. And so you, you get in that mindset of, okay, I'm going to make happen whatever I need to make happen to get the mission done. That's the mindset that you yep. get in yep. and you get back and, and you realize, okay, it takes a little time to realize that you can't just go, uh, you can't stay in that mode because that mode is not, that mode is actually considered to be criminal. And destructive. Indestructive yeah. in America. Yeah. Yep. In the normal civilian populace. Yeah. I remember, but my first feeling was, even when I was uh, sleeping in the IHOP when I came back, it's kind of a relief too when I I'm, I'm just looking around I see these people eating or walking around. So I say that's 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 the normal life, but I was I forgot about it almost mm-hmm. because it was, you're so immersed into that combat, into that um, the time there that again this become like a dream. Then you come back and it's like, well, oh, that's actually real, you know. That's uh, but also big relief. So I never realized that 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 that. that Think over your head always, well, I can get shot. Mm. We don't think about it, it never bothered me. But then when I came back, I was like, I'm not going to get shot. Mm. <laughs> it's just like, the well, first thing is, I'm, I'm good, I'm okay now. But then come the reflection, you think about the guys that did not come back. And that's, uh, it still bothers me. And um, that's, uh, uh, I think they will always stay with, with us uh, forever. That uh, almost, I don't know, it's, you call it like the, the survival, survivor guilt. Mm-hmm. That, yep. uh, That's what they call why it. Why me, why him, not me. And um, um, this is why I'm trying to cherish the memories of the guys that I knew they are not here anymore. Because, uh, you know, it fades. And I think uh, they are alive. In They still live in our minds. So what we can do for them is just remember them because if we forget who we remember. So they, they're still alive. They are alive in our minds that we see them, we remember them, and we need to cherish this. So it is so important to write the books about these guys who are not here anymore because who write? They can write their own book. We need to engage parents. And I was always tell parents of, uh, of our guys, look, um, that might not seem like a, like a lot, but they, they are. You wake up, and uh, you know this, the pain doesn't go away. You just live to learn with it, as a parent, as a spouse. But what you can do is just write little things that you remember. Uh, you, you, as you wake up, it's like, yeah, I remember he was doing this and that when he was a little kid. Write this down because those memories are fleeting. You might not remember it ten years down the road, but eventually, if you keep doing this, you will write the full picture, the image of your child, of your spouse, who is not longer with us, but it helps all of us remember it. So it is important that you do that. And uh, hopefully people are doing it because uh, you know that eventually will become a book and maybe you want to share, the parent or the spouse want to share with us the other person that we don't know. Because most of us know the guy, the guy like fucking warrior, you know, he goes up there, he kills the bad guys, he does what needs to be done. But there's also another side uh, to each of us, and we don't know that side of these people who n- didn't come back. So it's, it is important that we help maintain that memory of these guys. Yeah, there's um, no doubt about that. And e- even you know, with with the opportunity I have here, um, talking to guys, talking to veterans from other wars as well. And just just hearing their stories, and they still carry on the memories. Guys that guys from the Korean War, guys from Vietnam. Yep. That what you're saying is absolutely true. And there's like I read a lot of books that guys have written, and and that's that's the memory. That's what they left behind, yep. and they they remember, and they account for the friends and brothers that they lost in combat. And it's it's priceless. It's priceless yep. for us. 
And this is how we keep them alive, you know. This is how we keep their memory, by keeping their memory alive. Because they live in our minds. So, so you end up doing another, did your next two deployments, were those back to Iraq again? Yeah, yeah. And then when I came back, I realized that, you know, I'm 45. I haven't, at that time, I, my girlfriend dumped me because uh, my career was not really good. I wasn't making enough money. I, I was, she actually said in the email that uh, that really not, there's not the place she wants to be in. So I say, fuck, I mean, I'm, I'm like getting 45, I'm getting old guy, and I don't have, a, don't know even girls, you know? I don't, know, I, I don't have anybody. So I'm going to go and uh, find somebody. How do I find somebody? I think the easiest way is just go online and look for somebody. So I remember f- there was this, there's a site, American Singles. <laughs> and uh, I say, fuck yeah, I'm American. I'm <clears throat> going to go and get me a wife. So. So I'm American I'm, and I'm single. <laughs> this site's for me. <laughs> so, um, so I can't write very well, right? So I remember. So I, we are going, trying to f- finally I find the girl. I was like, look, she's so beautiful. I'm going to go and uh, let me see if I can wink to her. But I just need to tweak my age a little bit because she's so young. So, uh, so she's like maybe thir- she's 13 years younger. So. I just tweak my age a little bit. So I wink to her just to write something. Uh, she got to look at it and she she winked back. She wrote she wrote back and she wrote so nicely. So I say, fuck, if I write to her, she just she would just fired me right from the get go. She won't even talk to me. So so I talked to the team guys, say, hey, can you help me write the letters? What letters? Like love letters. So so we're going on. We had a guy had the guys writing the love letters to my present wife but uh, uh, just helping me out you know because when I write you know the, if I when I write it's like I is what I is you know yeah. I be what I be your love letter was uh, I like you yeah. do you like me <laughs> yeah yeah me love you very much and uh, so that wouldn't go well and uh, so the guys kept doing it and so I'm, I'm looking at this I'm reading her letters and this is so fucking awesome she writes so well she she's so polished she's uh, so educated then I find out, you know, she's Air Force Academy graduate. Uh, so I was like, oh, damn, this is like make it. Uh, my, the, the, the how, many, how many years did you chop off your age when you initiated this relationship? I think five. <laughs> because, so. uh, and uh, I'm glad I did because, uh, we're not talking to her later. So she had like a cut of limit. If somebody contacted her about that limit, yeah. uh, she just like <laughs> disappeared. So, so you were 45. She was, how old was she? 37. She was 37. 36, I think. 36. So you, you br- brought yourself down to a clean 40. Yes. Uh, like maybe 39, 40. Maybe 39. <laughs> so you know, I was strong. I was, uh, I was still, I still look young. And I was like, she can tell. But when she sees me, she will like me. So, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, uh, so the guys keep writing me, but eventually I say, look, Drago. We wrote you like I think hundreds of these letters. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you can what you can do right now is kind of paste and post. You can just make any letter you want, just does you know the, the copy and paste stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like fucking a bit worried about it, but say okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have like every letter. So she wrote me, me an email, I'm, and uh, I've tried to like make some st- things out. I guess it didn't go well because uh, I sent a letter and just click, she disappeared from that. <laughs> uh, what I found out later is that uh, she read that letter and the, she, her friends and her came to the conclusion that I'm either on drugs or drunk. So that didn't work very well. So it be better safe than sorry. <laughs> so she left. I was like, fuck, I think I fucked up. So I like the guys look and say, yeah, Drago, you did fuck up. You just put the shit totally backwards. <laughs> uh, so I'm like, damn, okay, I need to start over again. And then she shows up again. Well, she shows up because uh, I find out later that they offer her 30, free, 30 more free days, like a freebie, so she <laughs> showed somebody else. So yeah. she said, yeah, oh, sure, okay. I'm they better. said, we're sorry about that last Draco guy. <laughs> <laughs> we apologize. Here's, a, here's your money back, and you get 30 more days to find a normal human being. <laughs> yeah, I can't, yeah, I guess, you know, something. <laughs> And when, when she shows up, I was pretty desperate at the time. I really like her. I really, I, I love. She, you know, we talked for a while. We lo- wrote a lot of letters. I mean, my team guys wrote a lot of letters, and she wrote a lot of to me. So, um, so then, uh, f- uh, f- 
and, and she didn't respond. So I was like, I was pretty, just just call me, just just, just call me. You know, Wait, had you a, never had you talked before? No, just she was she's very proper. She was like, I'm, I'm going to talk to you. I don't know you even. I don't want to give you my phone number or anything. But eventually, I coerced her into calling me. Had you told her your life story? Had you told her that you had come from Poland or were you telling her that you were a freaking uh, hedge fund manager in New York or something? <laughs> I, uh, no, no. I just told him that I'm, I'm in the Navy. I'm doing well and, uh, you know, just just try to just be very very uh, vague about it. And I think that's maybe she didn't like it either, but they, I just try not to talk because if I say, yeah, MC, I just came back from Iraq. So then my guy might be crazy or something. <laughs> I so I, I try to stay out of it. But anyway, the guys did a really good job. You know, they, if they stay with me, they could continue. I think I, I would have no problems whatsoever. But anyway, I, I created a letter. It came out as a druggie or some drunk person. And then she just like, I don't want to mess with that. So um, I, but I, I finally I got her to call me. And I say, look, this is me, this is blah, blah. So I, I, I told her about myself, and she's like, quiet for a second, say, oh, you just don't speak English very well. It's not you are drunk on drugs, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, 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 no, I don't do any drugs. You know, I don't drink on, on occasions and uh, maybe wine sometimes. So we start talking about it, and uh, finally she agreed to come and visit me. I was totally in love, and... Uh, Yep, we are married now. <laughs> um, it, it, but yeah, that was that was a big thing that uh, that it, uh, yeah she, she thought that maybe I'm not not quite right <laughs> in my head. I was not. <laughs> but yeah, we we are married. We have two children now, and uh, together uh, a little girl, twelve years old, and a ten years, eleven years old boy. So, so how would you wrap up your your Navy career? I wrap my Navy career. Uh, so when I met her, uh, I went to Master Chief, and I was SEAL instructor at the time. I was in BUDS. I said, look, uh, I don't have any family. I have this girl right here. Uh, if I go uh, to war, I deploy, I'm, I'm just really scared to, uh, to lose her. I've been there so many times, so long time. Maybe you can find me some post that I can uh, just get married. I just wanted to get married, so I said, I'm to secure this girl. Um, and... Uh, uh, so first, uh, they say, okay, we'll try to help you, Drago. But the letter from command came in, well, for that position, we need somebody who is really polished and who speaks English very well, and Drago is neither one. <laughs> I've I, I seen this email. I, that was shown to me. So I say, fuck. <laughs> I'm marrying this girl anyway. But eventually, I was able to win all that. They sent me to Ohio, uh, NRD, and... Uh, we got married, of course, and uh, I retired from there. And it was kind of, I'm glad it happened this way because that transition kind of bring, brought me back to reality. You know, it's, it's not about just killing people and beating them up. It is more also about the living in society, being productive member of society. So, um, so that there was a good transition period for me that I could actually relax and uh, join the society back again and. Uh, uh, not be a villain, but be a good person, and uh, and yeah, I got domesticated now, so I'm the nice, uh, nice Drago, and uh, and uh, the life is good. Uh, my wife, she's uh, she has a master's degree in bioengineering. She's about to do her PhD, and uh, I'm here to support her. So we're doing well, and uh, I just miss the teams. Definitely. Well, you're always going to miss the teams. And uh, by the way, you were, you were, you you may have felt like a villain in some way, but I can tell you, bro, you were you were never a villain to me. You were always always freaking there, always there, every single time, um, on the good guys side. So, wh when you retired, what did you do? What did you do once you retired? What year did you retire? Uh, 2011. Okay. So, uh, before retirement. Uh, I was like, I was told I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do that. Uh, you know, when you come back from war, I think there's some issues uh, linger with you. And I was like, well, I didn't really care about the, doing the tab meetings, about that. I just wanted to go retire and move on with my life. I didn't know really want, they didn't really know what I'm going to do. But I was good in the programming and the, the, the software development. And my wife said, like, the, what you need to do is put your resume here and uh, start looking for the job. So finally I said, like, okay, 
I don't have the formal education. I'm a SEAL. I, I, I don't write software. I kill people. So uh, I, 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 I need to do something. So say, no, 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 no. You do have experience. You say you did a lot. And uh, she wrote, the, she helped me write the resume at the time. So I put the resume. I say, my well, good luck. Yeah, somebody will need to call me. Just back then, five days later, say, hey, we look, we have a position here. Would you like to come and talk to us? So I was like, sure, absolutely, yes. So I ran up up there and I got the job. I, before even I retired, I already have a job. Hmm. Like I think in two weeks before retirement, I got the job. So I didn't start it yet until my, but my on my leave, I was working. So my my retirement leave. And. Uh, and that's rolled in, you know. That's just I'm getting more and more experience. I learn more and more from the guys, uh, uh, from the software engineers working with me. And uh, so my life is what it is right now. I'm actually uh, uh, I I end up developing quite few programs. One of them is Connecting. Well, this is uh, uh, as you know my views. My uh, I'm very open about the socialism and how dangerous the socialism is. That uh, when any time I posted on Facebook something about socialism, they banned me. They would just basically stop my account. People were calling me names, and I couldn't even respond to it because Facebook was Facebook was blocking it. So I say, "Fuck these guys, fucking communists!" I'm going to go and uh, create my own Facebook. So I create Connecting, and we have thousands of people right now on the site posting. There's n- no censorship. Everybody is welcome. It's not the the, the, the the right, left side. It's just, you know, if you have, if you like to say something and not to be worried about being banned or ostracized by uh, Zuckerfucker, whatever his name is, and or, or, or this other twerp from Twitter, come to Connecting and you are welcome to, to say whatever you like to say, you know, just please keep the violence down and uh, not the, nothing violent, but just you're welcome to speak, be open. And so, so it's it's connect zing z i n g connect zing, and what what I'm I'm now a member of connect zing. I'm on there. What one thing that I I was thinking about as you were telling or talking about everything today, I mean it couldn't there couldn't be any better parallel between what you experienced in life and and starting this. So at one point in your life, the communist government shut down all communications inside of your country and completely suppressed the populace. And what you did back then as a freaking whatever, 19, 18, 20 year old, was you said, okay, they're trying to stop us from communicating, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a a freaking newspaper. And we're gonna go and we're gonna run around in the background and we're gonna print it and we're gonna distribute it out there to people. So even as a kid, you realized the importance of free speech. Free speech, yes. And so now yes. you're in a situation where you, you got banned from the, the, the social media platforms, and so you did, you're doing the same thing. Okay, look, you don't, want me to, you don't want me to speak? You don't want me to have free speech? Okay, here I go. And so you cr- created this website and this platform that people can now Communicate, and they don't have to have any fear of being suppressed. B- being suppressed. Yes, and it is important for me. I, I I see that I think we are going the wrong direction. That suppression of free voice eventually will destroy can destroy our country. Um, you see, the socialism has seven things in con- common. Whether this is Adolf Hitler socialism, Adolf Hitler uh, national socialism whether it's Bernie Sanders socialism or Pelosi socialism, they all have one thing in common, it's intimidation, violence, poverty, having a villain, like Stalin, Joseph Stalin had the kulaks, those wealthy mm-hmm. passions, they were villains, they were always vilified. Mm-hmm. Adolf Hitler had Jewish people, he vilified this entire group. And Pelosi have, uh, seems to me like veterans and middle class. So, um, that, so the, the, the villain is very important, element of socialism, but also political prisoners and political murders. And the biggest hallmark of, of, I think, totalitarian socialist state is where state entities are attacking and intimidating political opponents. We had IRS, uh, uh, you remember, I'm sure you remember that, attacking and vilifying uh, the, the opponents. 
uh, and other state entities. So this is where I, I think we are in a very dangerous spot and we need to act on it. Political prisoners, you know, in socialism, they always say we don't have political prisoners because nobody sits for political reasons. He sits for stealing a meal. This guy sits for just maybe driving on the curb uh, w w with his car. This guy sits for something else, but there's no political prisoners, but they all sit for political reasons. And, you know, we have here General Flynn. I mean, what happened to him? Uh, you always find something that you can uh, show me a man, I will, I, I, I will stick the paragraph to him. So they will find something to intimidate political op opponents. And I think it's time to turn around our country. We can have uh, the, the things that are happening right now are very disturbing to me. They're too much like that socialism that I experience. And I, just like I said earlier, if people only took time to ask refugees from the former socialist countries in Eastern Europe and stood against evil, we wouldn't have any Democrats left in the office. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. it, is so, it is so bad. I mean, um, I'm really concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had, some, uh, we had some Vietnamese Vietnam War veterans on, and they certainly expressed very similar concerns. They lived through communism. They escaped communist countries. And they hate seeing, and they're 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 sickened when they see similar uh, similar things occurring here. And they, you know, it's a warning. It's it a is, warning. It is a warning. You better heed it before it's too late. Um, if not too late already, because um, yeah, that's uh, we we already have we already had socialist elections, and seems like the rules are being implemented. I was when I was talking to people about it in two thousand eight. That was laughed off. It's like that's not going to happen here. We have we have been we are having now right now implemented uh, the rules are being implemented, allowing for socialist elections. Mm -hmm. Socialist elections, I mean, uh, elections where communists, Marxists, and socialists always win. Now. <sighs> On top of that, and I know that you got that going on, you also have a you also have a foundation to help guys that were in the SEAL teams, guys that are in the SEAL teams, if they if they run into hard times for whatever reason, you have a, a fund that people can donate to. What's what's that all about? It is Navy SEALs Fund. It's five oh one C three Navy SEALs Fund dot org. Not foundation, it's Navy SEALs Fund, F U N D. And uh, this is to help our guys because there's a lot of team guys that lay, leave the teams before their time, uh, before their retirement, and they have pretty much no help, no support, or very little support. Um, so, and I've seen so many guys going with broken lives because they miss the payment here, they miss the payment there, they, 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 they work, they lost the job. Uh, they, some of them, they, they, their whole uh, life was collapsing in front of them. So what we create is like no red tape uh, uh, charity that, look, if you are any time, at any time, 5326, we will help you. We don't let you fall down. And uh, it's uh, just f no, nobody gets paid. So if you can look at our website, there's a bunch of team guys with the same attitude, with the same ideals that we, we need to help each other. and. Again, they don't want to get paid. They don't want the money. It is not about the money. This is something that we can give back to those less fortunate. Because there's a big problem. Look, uh, I was lucky. I, I, I came back, I met my wife. She was able to domesticate me and, 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 and create a human being out of me again. But there's a lot of guys that come back, or, or do they? They get caught up in this, uh, 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 in this violent cycle that you know, the, the skills from the Navy SEAL teams don't translate well on civilian, uh, in civilian life. Not many things, not many. Some people have a hard time in the transition. So what is happening with these guys is, well, you know what, um, I can't get the job, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to go get contracting. I'm going to go overseas again, you know, should, should some, you know, do the, pretty much the same job. Mm -hmm. But when I come back with a lot of money, I can get a regular job. I can get with my, back with my family. The guy comes back after six months with tons of money, he's trying to find a job. Six months later, he has no job and has no money. What do you do? Well, I'm tired. They're tired. They, they, 
they, they just have no choice. I say, I need to get back. I need to go back into that world again. So, and that cycle repeats itself. We have a guy caught up in this cycle. You know, not everybody. There are some people that like this lifestyle and they can continue on, but there's many guys that can't get out of it. So this is where we step in. We want to go and help those guys. If you want to get out of this, uh, we are here to help you. And uh, we, we stay watch over you. Awesome. Awesome, man. Look, we've been going for a, a while now. <laughs> uh, probably a good place to um, probably play a good place to wrap up. I know. Uh, you know. You know what we missed. You know what we didn't talk about was one of my funnest things in life was was introducing you to jujitsu. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was a great thing. And how excited you were. You were so excited when you learned that you could choke people and you could arm lock people. And I remember you got into a scrap somewhere. We were you know, out somewhere and you got into a scrap and, and you, I, I wasn't there. You came back to me the next day and you, 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 you had the, you had a look of just joy on your face and <laughs> you said, Jocko, Jocko. And I was like, what's going on, man? You said, I got in a fight last night. And I was like, oh, okay, did you get in trouble? He's like, no, 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 no. I choked the guy. I choked him. You were so happy and so proud. And I, and I was quite proud as well. <laughs> Actually, do I have to do odd to it something too, because this is what gets, sometimes get odd and misunderstand, or even within our community, within our guy. So, you know, when I used to fight, when I was, the way I grew up is you, you fight until you decide the guy that, that you, the fight is over. Not when the guy tells you, okay, well, I, I got it, you know, that, that is over, you know, you, you are better. And, and then he, as soon as you turn around, he, he lunch he lunch at you. So you just beat the guy until he doesn't move. And then, which is what you need to be careful with is, and it actually happened to me before, that he'll then choke on his own tongue if you roll the wrong way. Now, you need to go because the police are about to come in, so just if you leave him there, so the, yeah, like he dies or not. So the, the technique that uh, I learned in Poland is uh, a pin-up type. So you just pin up, they make a pin-up out of the guy. You, 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 you put the pin through his lip and through his tongue and pin his tongue to his lip. So that way, whatever he rolls in once you leave, he's not going to suffocate on his own tongue. And people are like, oh, so, so what, 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 is it real? Yeah, it is real because the, then you can leave and safely guy in, the, in, in that position. And when he wakes up, he just feel that he has a safety pen in it, so just unpin his tongue from his lip and go home uh, versus being dead, you know, and then you get in trouble. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's actually a good technique that uh, a lot of people, I think, I think adopted, I think, because I, I taught that to quite a few guys. <laughs> that is the best there way. was also a good one where we were going through some kind of combatives training and the instructors, they had like these boxes like taped on the floor. And the purpose of these boxes was that if you had to handle a situation, you know, in a hand to hand situation, those boxes represented the area that you needed to stay in because if you got out of that area, you're actually interfering with other guys' field of fire. So it was almost a way for them to prove that, look, you just need to stay still and whatever, if you can't do it inside of this little box here, then it's probably not gonna work. And so they, they did some things with me with, with grappling and it was kind of funny, but then they take you and they go, all right, you know, you stand in this box and they put another, like one of the instructors in the box and they said, you know, if you're in this little space like this, you know, these kick these kicks that you're talking about, they wouldn't work because you're you're too close. Yeah, they were demonstrated. Yeah, yeah, and then so then they go, uh, they go, uh, okay, Drago, you know, you're standing in this box, you're not allowed to leave the box, but try and kick him. Try and kick him in the head. And uh I did. apparently they didn't know that you had very flexible legs and wham you freaking kicked this guy in the head. Yeah, he it fell was, off this box. It, yeah. it was, he was definitely out of the box. It was freaking awesome. Uh, um, but you know, I remember too, I'm so glad that you mentioned about this because when you show up in the platoon, I'm, I remember you just came and said, guys, I'm going to check out the entire platoon in five minutes. <laughs> like, okay. So you started it and as they progress, like within a, a 30 seconds, you, people are tapping out or pass out. Next, next. So I seen like a couple guys quietly just inching their way out of the room. And uh, so, you know, you check out whoever was left up there, including myself. But uh, that was actually a good experience. And uh, we, there we start learning 
And I remember, I remember that, that I was not that technically, I was pretty strong, but not technically very well. And I was wrestling with one of the officers. And I remember I was trying almost everything. I was pin, I had to pin him down. I was, but I almost rip his hand off and, and <laughs> didn't work and didn't work. He was laying there and, and I was trying everything. And finally, like 30 minutes later, he finally tapped out and gave up. Then you woke up and said like, well, you know what? Uh, I didn't want to go interfere with this, but you are doing okay. But if you take his hand, just wait, just push a little bit down, he'll be tapping out right away. So I just like, Try it, and this guy like, do that. <laughs> I say, fuck, I wish I knew that. I've spent 30 minutes trying to get his arm off. And, and, and here's a simple technique to do it. So, so yeah, that's, that was pretty funny. Or poor Scotty, when he was, that's actually scared me a little bit because I didn't know it. Um, we were wrestling, you were overwatching us, and then that's, so I'm like, I'm doing pretty good, you know. It's like, but he's not tapping out, so I'm just wrapping him up. And then I see you and other team guy, other other guy from the platoon, just prying me out of Scott. It's like, hey, yeah, yeah, stop, stop, stop. I say, stop for fucking what? I, I say, he's stopping out. I say, no, he's not. He's stopping out. No, he's not. And then he say, wait, uh, do you hear? Did you hear this? Tip, 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 tip. <laughs> I say. Yeah, but what does that mean? He said, well, he couldn't breathe and he couldn't tap. There was, he was no way to tap out. And Scott said, dude, I don't die, man. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't tap out. So I could say it was, I couldn't have a breath to even say stop. I, all I could do is tip, 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 tip. And then, uh, then, then you stopped. So yeah. I was like, that's pretty cool. Actually, that's like, wow, that's fucking jiu-jitsu. That works, man. <laughs> yeah, that particular individual was kind of claustrophobic. And I remember I would train with him. And when, when someone's super claustrophobic like that, sometimes I like to sort of uh, give them some exposure therapy and try and make them more used to it. But I remember him just, he's going, he's just like, get off, he, get off me. And he was so mad, get off me, man. I'm not, deep. I'm not down with this. And he's walking off the mat. He's so mad. He was freaking hilarious. But it was nothing unusual to see, you know, that's having guys pass out. So we were shaking their hand, their legs. Yeah, like, okay, I'll shake his legs. He'll be okay. You know, it's like, passing, like Who, what happened? It's like, what happened? I'm like, oh, well, you guys got choked out. Is you okay? <laughs> Good times. Good times. Awesome. Uh, right on. Echo Charles. Yes. Speaking of getting after it, sure. speaking of jujitsu, jiu speaking of, you know, maintaining the good physical condition, which yep. I'm, I'm really, when you're telling me that you didn't like work out or anything, bro, you're a freaking mutant. Cause you're strong as sh You're like, oh, it's pretty strong. Like you're strong as shit to <laughs> wrestle with, man. <laughs> That's just how. Uh, when I was speaking 19, of being strong, yeah. Now that I, now that I'm speaking that, so when we were lifting, we were all trying to get jacked. So oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, whatever. Remember. If I guess there's nothing, I, and I don't know if you necessarily brought this from the Eastern Bloc, but but Drago taught us this thing, or would do this thing where we would lift when you're getting when you're getting your lift on. Sure. He had this. Uh, Primal, uh, this primal noise. <laughs> so, so whenever like the platoon was in a gym somewhere overseas, you'd just hear guys going, "Yatst!" <laughs> actually, actually, you know, in Iraq, it? Yes, every platoon came in uh, who came to because I was staying there, but the platoons rolled through through Baghdad. So everybody was living with arts, arts, yeah, yeah arts. <laughs> and um, so, but every every single platoon was kind of, I said, okay, Drago, we are screaming the arts for for fucking months here. <laughs> what does the fuck means arts? It's like. I don't know. <laughs> it's like it means everything, you know. Is it good? Ah, it's good. You know. <laughs> Does it suck? Ah, it sucked. So, <laughs> so it like means everything. Yeah. I, I was talking <laughs> to my my uh, kids, and I was like, "Oh yeah, my my friend's coming on the podcast today," and they're like, "Oh whatever, they don't care." But then I was like, "This is the guy that originally said." Ah, because when my kids would work out, I'd be like, hey, look, when you're going to go for that big clean, you yeah. got to get fired up. What you got to do is give yourself a little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so speaking of. Yeah. Here we go. What do well, you got? that there's in powerlifting, there's that or oh, some sure. version of that. Yeah. And there's always that it's at yeah. the end. Uh, maybe there's like a physiological technique for that. Tightens up when you if you're gonna do it, it tightens up kind of your your uh, your posterior chain, right? Like you got to make your whole your whole like rib cage kind of yeah. Like if you do it hard, everything's gonna get tight. Stra straighten up that spinal area. Yeah, it's kind of like saying? you know. Okay, so that, there's a method that's that has a name for it. 
when you yeah, it's basically called yachts. no no <laughs> but but also when you are beating somebody up and you add this ads to it it scares them even more oh, so yes. it's kind of easy oh yeah <laughs> yeah th- yeah fully but that there is a tech that technique has a name like to tighten up everything mm. it's almost like there's a breath hold like scenario a brace, in I think there. call it brace for it or something no it's like a theory it, it's, a, it's an odd word i forget what it is yachts. but when you say that's st- that's mm. like a it's like you're not totally holding your breath. You're giving in a little air. It's kind of like, you know, when you get, the, you know, those, uh, what do you call the blood pressure things? Yeah. You know, you pump it, pump it, pump, and then you let out a little bit. It's mm. kind of like that mm. kind of thing. Anyway, I think it's a furrow technique. It cool. doesn't block completely your breathing. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of gives you that extra pressure that you need, but <laughs> yeah. you still have that uh, like pressure valve. Yes, that's t- it's true, yeah. So yeah. maybe maybe just that's just how you kind of grew up, you know, in your mind. You just It came very natural. Probably what happened. Yeah, it, it worked. It worked for me. For I think for all of us because all the guys and the, the, whether team five, seven, or whoever whatever team showed up up there, they all end up with ads. Ads. Yeah. 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 Makes you a little bit stronger. Uh, actually, I got the call not too long time ago. I said, Drago, what the fuck that ads means? The people are always asking me, and I have I don't know what to tell them. I said, it means everything, dude. <laughs> yeah. it just means. Oh hell yeah! When I was, it means nothing, but it means everything. Yeah. 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 You like it. Uh, a little deeper. When I was in college, I got knee surgery because they blew on my ACL. Mm-hmm. And before I got surgery, I was like, okay, what's the recovery time and all this? And they're like, you know, it's, it, it depends. And they asked me, are you Polish? Are you, do you have any Polish blood? Mm-hmm. And I said, no, why? I said, because Polish people tend to heal faster. Dang. So they, for real, this is what the, literally what the doctor told me, Polish and Samoan. So How come maybe, they didn't ask you if you were Samoan? They did. Oh, okay, they asked but, you both. Yeah, but Drago doesn't have... Someone you bring so this up, le- yeah. less relevant we'll just say i'm just saying his yeah, durability yeah. may be attributed to his genetic you know scenario blood i'll look at the bar time and maybe hopefully that will help me get got through but uh, also the, i think uh, attitude it was never like i remember we see before the hell or during the hell week they say so why you are here what did you why would you come to bars and stuff well i want to try to be a best seal the best guy i try to be a seal i tried this i tried that so they came to me, I said, I'm not fucking trying anything. I'm here to be a SEAL. I just, I will be a SEAL unless I get injured or kick me out. So uh, I'm not trying. I'm just on my way to be a SEAL. Just <laughs> they, it. they kind of liked it, but yeah. I got beat up for that. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely didn't get to beat down for that one. Makes sense. What do we got, man? Uh, oops. Either way, we yes, we are on the path. Um, so on this path. Not all of us are quite as durable, or mm-hmm. maybe we are. I don't know, but mm-hmm. we got supplementation, Jocko Fuel. So we got stuff for your joints, joint warfare. We, we cool. have a review. We have a, an automatic review. Drago has been drinking the Dak Savage drink. And what what, what do you think? I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I, 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 for, this, on, 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 for many reasons. One is that the taste of it, because um, I, I was telling you earlier, about those candies in Poland. They say this the specific taste of candies that were so rare that you can actually trade this candy for between the kids. And um, there was like a caramel white candy within the so this is it. This is the this is that candy which I was always addicted. It's like Dr. Pepper. <laughs> when I had the first Dr. Pepper, I said, Holy shit, this is America. You know, it's <laughs> like a, we were struggling up there to have one candy like this and here you can just go to the machine and get yourself one. There so, you go. So that I love the taste. So, and, uh, yeah. so it tastes like America. What? It tastes like America. Yeah, what? There you go. It's odd because on, on the way down here I was thinking about it, you know, like a regular uh, we'll call it for lack of a better term. A traditional energy drink. Oh, an old poisonous old energy poisonous. drink. So okay. exactly right. So poisonous, right? And here's the weird thing: everyone knows that. It's so weird how everyone knows mm-hmm. that. Like if they say, "Okay, so let's say you just did some jujitsu, you just worked out or something," you're like, "Man, I'm thirsty or whatever." You know, you let me like, go, ah, whatever. Now I need drinks. <laughs> yeah, you were like, you're not going to the soda machine. You're not getting some soda pop. You're right. not getting an energy, like an energy drink, traditional one. Brad, that sounds like the last thing you want to drink. Last thing you need. Maybe Check. Even, yeah. But meanwhile. Meanwhile, you can get you America the, the in a can. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> not only are you kind of in the mood for it sometimes, um, like right after like a hard workout, it's actually good for you. Yeah. See what I'm saying? But isn't it weird how everyone just knows that that. An energy drink is they, bad they for know. you. It's, it's a like known, the, like it's, it's a known thing. It's mainstream already. Yep. It's crazy. Check. Well, if you want to get those, if you want to get some joint warfare for your joints, if you want to get krill oil for your joints, if you want to get some 
what vitamin D three. Yeah, which is all kinds of other also very good for you for many reasons. Milk, which is protein disguised as dessert. It's true. Anyways, you can get all this stuff at jockofuel.com or you can get you can get the drinks at Wawa out on the East Coast or you can get the stuff at the vitamin shop. Yep, all and, available there. And consider getting the subscription. So mm-hmm. originusa.com. You want a subscription to this stuff, you can save some money. Free shipping, mm-hmm. by the way. Well, that's kind of a big deal. It's not even a by the way. That's almost the primary reason. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the primary reason is we don't want to not have what we want when we need it. Yes. But another good reason is it's expensive to ship stuff. Yeah. But if you subscribe, shipping's free, and that's cool. Boom, and you get it every month or when you need. You don't run out. It's no, a big thing. It doesn't out. seem like a big thing, but try to run out. You're going to know it's going to be a big thing. Anyway, originusa.com, that's where you can sign up, right? That's mm-hmm. pretty much the main yep. spot. Yep. What For is the it? subscription. What is it? Originusa.com. Yeah. Yep. That's yep. the spot right there. Also at originusa.com is jujitsu stuff. So we talked about jujitsu briefly. Mm-hmm. We could have talked more. Oh, well, yeah. But, uh, you know. <laughs> very <laughs> effective. Yes, very effective. <laughs> but, yeah, you want some geese, uh, American-made geese, rash guards, other jujitsu stuff, other athletic stuff, too. Yep. Originusa.com. Yeah, made in America, by the way. So, Drago, I haven't really dove into this with you, but we we – are, we now have a company where we are making products in America. We're making jujitsu geese, we're making rash guards, we're making boots, we're making jeans, we're making everything in America. I know that because I was, I was, I was following you. Oh, 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 right on. Yeah. Well, the freaking crazy thing is like, like for instance, jeans. Everyone gets a pair of whatever name brand jeans and they think that they're getting an iconic American jean, but they're not. They're actually getting jeans that are made in communist countries that's where they're made so we don't like that Mm. we like our genes to come from america by hard made by hardworking people so origin usa dot com (laughs) (laughs) yes yes (laughs) also on that same sort of tip let me direct your attention to jockostore.com this is where you can get uh you know more apparel more representative directly of the path. So discipline equals freedom, good, all these things. That's where you can get it. We have a subscription situation going on as well. It's a good one. A little bit different designs, but still applicable. It's just so FYI. So you, you can get this thing. It's called the Shirt Locker if you want to get one of these cool T-shirts. Here's the thing. because some This is the reason I'm bringing this up. Is someone went online and was like, that you posted something? Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey, none of these T-shirts are on the store. On jockostore.com and yes and no, but right. Please. Well, explain. Yes, so people do okay. understand. Yes, they are on Jocko Store, but they're only through the subscription yeah. scenario, the shirt locker. So that's the only place you can get them. It, it, again, like if you do, I mean, if you even care about like the difference or whatever, it's just they're the designs are a little bit. We'll just say they're a little bit more creative from time to time. Nonetheless, um, it, you know, they're a little bit different. They're cool. They're fun. Uh, you will get a new one every month. Boom, yep. there it is. There you go. Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast. You can subscribe to some other podcasts. We got the the Unraveling podcast with Daryl Cooper. We got the Grounded podcast. We got the Warrior Kid podcast. There's new episodes out, by the way. Yes, sir. I was really slow in getting those out, but they're out. They you can get your warrior kids listen to those. You can also you can also join the underground, jockounderground.com, where we go into a little bit more detail, a little bit of behind the scenes research. Yep. Also some good, the, a lot, because some people ask like, hey, what, uh, do you guys do Q&A yep. still? You know, I, yeah. I'm wondering about this and this. I'm, I'm, ooh, good questions. But mm-hmm. yes, the answer is yes. We do do the Q&A, but it's on the underground exclusively to the underground maybe maybe not but yeah. currently we, we don't know yet well, we did, we, well here's the deal we had people that signed up to be on the underground that subscribed to the underground that asked questions so we answered their questions on one of the first uh, underground q and a's so anyways go to jockounderground.com if you want to subscribe to that if you can't afford it costs eight dollars and 18 cents a month by the way if you can't afford that look we still want you to get the information you can email assistance at jockounderground.com We'll take care of you. We got a YouTube channel where uh, Echo puts videos up that he creates. That we'll he put more too, by the way. Oh, are got we? some new uh, conceptual ideas? Okay, so if you're waiting for Echo's conceptual ideas, they should be <laughs> produced within the next 24 months. 
<laughs> because his work ethic is well, it's solid, dude. It's not it's hot. It's not. Well, he, doesn't well, say, he doesn't create videos varying, and say ah, varying <laughs> levels of. Yeah, not happening a lot of, uh, from maybe you should time. maybe you should go home get in front of your editing <laughs> suite <laughs> right. and just go axed and maybe we'll get some more right. freaking videos done. I want to get so off, might be like ah, <laughs> that's what it, that's what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, he, gonna be, ah, yeah. If you I got think, the legit, you yeah. know that ads ah, actually is part of my. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, the, the Dragos accelerated English course for terrorists. <laughs> that's the, ma- that's the <laughs> no, main. That's the main. That's the main motivator. Yes. People hear that one time and oh, they're telling you the, yeah. where their firstborn child is. <laughs> this oh, is yeah, good yeah, advice. Yeah, they, Thank they, you. They, they speak really good English after that. <laughs> uh, psychological warfare. You can get that on any MP3 platform. We got Flipside Canvas. FlipsideCanvas.com. My brother Dakota Meyer, Marine Corps. He's got a company where he's making things to hang on your wall. We got a bunch of books. Okay, the first book that I want to talk to you about is the book that I started off this podcast today. I took one little section. Uh, the, the book is called, and you're going to have to help me with all this, uh, Drago. So the book is called Camp Posey. The writer, his name is, how do I say it? Novel. Novel. So Novel was a, a guy in the Grom, in the Polish Grom, special operations guy. I don't know too much about him because I can't read Polish, but the book is available and I ordered it, but I haven't gotten it yet. It's available on Amazon. So if you want to get this book, look up Camp Posey. And it, it, I, I did look through it. There's pictures of... Um, well, us too. I mean, it was because he was deployed with us. He was the, when you were there and I was there. Yep. So uh, yep. it's but, our pictures. Uh, yep. There's pictures of where we were. There's pictures of Camp Jenny Posey, which is freaking brings back all kinds of memories yeah, for us because we were doing so much good work out of there. A uh, bunch of pictures in it, and, and you can get an English version. So check that out, Camp Posey. Have you read it? Oh, I have read it. Yes, I read it both. And so, I, I read it in Polish and English, and it's very accurate. I, say, I think it's, it, it, it gives you the, 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 the perspective from the other, other guys mm-hmm. who are not part of the SEALs, but they are really good. They... they, 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 they and how they perceive SEAL teams, right. how they see us, how what we do in Iraq and how they work. So it's pretty good insight and the perspective on SEALs from the different vantage point. And then what about this other book that you brought today, which I haven't seen? Um, so what's this called? Uh, this is uh, uh, the title of the translation is uh, My 13 Years in the uh, Grom. Okay. So this is the, it's not my 13 years. This is this guy. Does that say 13 right there? Yes, 13. That's exactly, that's 13 in Polish. So it's 13, my 13 lat w jednostce wojskowej Grom. So that's what he used said. To hear that, I used to hear that over the radio sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when he wouldn't switch that dial, he'd be like, bring me right. be like, Drago, Drago, please, bro. <laughs> it's us. <laughs> you are on the English channel, Drago. <laughs> switch mode. So this guy was with us too. He, actually, the Haim and the Naval, Naval, they were together in, uh, in, in I think, at the same time there. So this is uh, he wrote this book much earlier and uh, same thing he just uh, his view on the Iraq war on the our working together with seals and that uh, how this thing uh, 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 you know but I think it's, it's very interesting especially if you want to look and uh, about us about seals and how others perceive us mm-hmm. Other forces. Do you know if so. this is this book available on Amazon? Is it, it available? It is also in available on Amazon. It is also. I will send you the links. Uh, the, it is also available in English on Amazon. So and the uh, and the English title is also Thirteen Years. My Thirteen Years. My Thirteen uh, Years uh, at the Grom. Grom. Yeah. Yeah. Do I'm just flipping through this one. This one's got a bunch of pictures. F- very that look very familiar as well. Yeah, I mean the, the, those are pictures taken when we were there. So. Yeah. That's, that's, Freaking awesome! All right, so we got these books. Check these books out. Um, we and Drago and I already talked about hopefully getting one of those guys or both those guys on the podcast at some point if they can come over here from Poland or maybe you know what might we make an exception and do a not live like not face to face? We have never done that before. We've never done a a virtual right. podcast. Maybe we would do it for Pol- for Poland, like Skype or something. Yeah, we haven't uh, done actually. It yet. One of them, I think, would be traveling here too. So uh, that's all we need to know. We'll just uh, that would be awesome if actually he could travel and tell his perspective on Iraq War, why Poland got involved in it, and why Poland was standing by our side. Uh, 
in that war and why is Poland standing by our side? So be good to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, th- that'd be awesome. A uh, bunch of other books too. I got a new book coming out called Final Spin. You can pre-order it right now. If you want the first edition, I don't think we've talked about that yet on Final Spin. If you want the first, have we? <laughs> If you want that first edition. I think you mentioned it last time, I think, but yeah, you didn't go. Look, don't be coming up to me in whatever when the book comes out two months after it comes out and you roll up to me, hey, Chaco, I got your book. And I look at it. I'm going to (laughs) know. You're going to know. We're all going to know. We're all going to know. You got the second edition. Uh, pre-order that one right now. Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual, The Cold Evaluation Protocol, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual, Way of the Warrior Kid, one, two, three, and four. Check those out, Mikey and the Dragons. Which is, a, which is apparently the best kid's book ever. Yeah. That's what I've heard. And then About Face by David Hackworth. I wrote a forward on a new version. Honored to do that. Extreme Ownership, The Dichotomy of Leadership. That's the OG of Jocko Books that I wrote with my brother Leif Babin. We got a consulting company, Echelon Front. Go to echelonfront.com. We got EF Online if you want online virtual training. Go to efonline.com. If you want to come see us live, go to extremeownership.com. We got three events this year because we're having three events this year. So if you want to come, go to extremeownership.com. It's a leadership a leadership seminar live in person. We also have an event coming up called EF Battlefield where we walk the Battle of Gettysburg. We walk the battlefield there and talk about the lessons that were learned. This is an unbelievable event. We sold. We 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 were only going to do one. We sold it out. We're doing two now, hopefully. So if we can get things scheduled, we're going to make that happen. Go to echelonfront.com/events if you want to come to that. And if you want to help service members, active and retired. If you want to help their families, if you want to help Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom. She has her own organization. And if you want to help, you want to donate, you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want to hear more from us, which is highly unlikely at this point, but if you want to, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Echo is at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. Now, if you want to talk to Drago, he's not on those platforms. I'm banned from his, his free speech has been suppressed, <laughs> but don't worry. He's on the underground. He's making things happen. You can check him out at connectzing.com. I'm also on there now, too, because, well, if Drog was there and he's hanging out, I'm there, <laughs> and I'm going to be hanging out, too. Echo, you got any final thoughts? No, that's it, man. Good to see you again. We met briefly yes, downtown yes. in my nightclub days with my good friend Jeremy. And yes. he uh, he introduced me to you back a long time ago. It was like <laughs> yep. almost twenty years, like long time ago. Jeremy like Fisk, say hi to him. He's a great guy. Oh yeah, I love this guy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I met him. I remember Drago. I was like, ooh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> he seems very nice, but he could probably get nuts. So all good. Good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. This was nice to see right you on. again, and uh, it was great to be here. Drago, any fantastic. any other closing thoughts, man? Um. I say maybe make, make, make a small prayer in our mind for those guys who are no longer with us. And uh, maybe a few seconds of silence to honor them. Yeah, and um, I don't know when this podcast is, is actually coming out, but... Um, Today is is March twentieth. Today is is Mark Lee's birthday, and I mean, just an incredible, incredible man, incredible seal, incredible husband, incredible son, and uh, miss him and the rest of the boys every day. So. Happy birthday to Mark. And Drago, man, thanks for your service. Thanks for your service to the teams. Thanks for your service to the Navy. Thanks for having my back countless times. And thank you for your service to America. And and beyond that, thanks for your service to the ultimate cause of freedom in the world. You can't 
repay freedom. There's people are asking me, thank you. This is the other way around, Jacko, actually. I have, there's me who's supposed to say thank you to you, to you, to every American for my freedom. What I did in the teams, in the Navy, is just a token for, 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 for you cannot repay freedom. You c- the, the freedom is not for sale. It's, it's not, uh, there is nothing you can do to reciprocate that freedom that, 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 we, that I got from America. I'm free man, and that's an awesome feeling. It's, it's something that I will never be able to reply, re- repay. And uh, I just I believe that just keep serving in any capacity I can to our great America is important. So I'm not done yet. I've, I've finished my military career, but I'm still serving. I am still want to make America a better, a safer place. Well, I'm into that. And uh, I, I know I will always be proud to call you brother. And to all the other people out there, especially those that are out there wearing the cloth of the nation, thank you for protecting the most precious thing that we have, and that is our freedom. And the same goes for our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all the other first responders out there. Thank you for protecting us here at home. And everyone else, just remember that freedom is not free and we cannot take it for granted there is evil in the world there is oppression in the world and we must be on guard for authoritarian and tyrannical leaders and like drago we must be willing to stand up and fight for our freedom and until next time this is drago and echo And Jocko, out.